Kalo's moves. Kuo, Peace Summit Room. But I wonder if this new god would also prefer peace between you three, Ikigo said, taking in the shocked expressions of everyone in the room, and you could see each mind racing. The devout quickly went from shock to elation while the devils and the fallen grew concerned and worried. Let's make this clear, I know that God can be reborn. Not when or how to make it happen, only that it can happen. That didn't seem to matter much to the group as he could see the start of a cacophonous argument right there as every leader opened their mouths. Before the first voice could ring out, Ikigo slammed an open palm on the table with a resounding crack that stole everyone's attention. Talk, like reasonable adults. Does knowing about God's rebirth change the purpose of this meeting? Or does knowing that suddenly mean that you would rather restart the war? They all became calm and returned to their seats. No. Though the angels will always serve our Lord, we personally do not seek war and conflict anymore, but we will if our Lord demanded it. Michael said, giving the first truly happy smile Ikigo's seen on him, but earning uneasy looks from the devils and fallen angels. So, while I am still the leader of heaven, our mission will be to make this peace one that even God would longing to keep. Michael declared with determined conviction and focus, a fresh change from the long-standing sorrow and despair that seemed to be his default expression. That same declaration gained similar approving smiles from the other factions. Love one another as I have loved you, a commandment that we of heaven and the church have failed to follow all too often. And we can trace the devil's prejudice back to the original Lucifer wanting to be the antithesis of God's try at absolute good by becoming an absolute evil. Sir Zetch is added, thinking back to one devil he was certain was somewhere out there. Who decided that all the devils had to be like the original? We don't even ask for souls if it can be avoided. Sounds like we all might unite under a single god if this keeps up. Azazel said, almost laughing at the irony of the matter of faithful devils. But we're missing a few crucial details, like how are we going to manage this? We can already share our knowledge and resources, but something like this needs something far more substantial. Like political marriages? Oreheim suddenly chimed in. I mean, the different soul races of the Gotai used to be at each other's throats ten years ago. Shinigami, Hollow, Quincy, they hated each other and fought constantly. The Quincy were almost completely wiped out. And then one guy was born that was a perfect hybrid mix, brought them under a united banner, and married at least two members of each race. Uryu said, Difference is that uniting under our dear Captain Commander was preferable to the stagnation of the Hollows and the parasitic tyranny of the original Quincy Emperor. These guys don't exactly have that set of circumstances forcing their hand. Well, that's not entirely right, Azazel suddenly said, looking to the silver hair fallen angel. Shemazai, you're up. The angel in question rose from his seat. While we of the Grigori have been gathering sacred gears, longiness, balance breakers, and researching them all, we've discovered the existence of what can only be considered a terrorist group attempting to do much the same, but with far more malicious intentions by gathering the more troublesome members of every faction. They call themselves the Kaos Brigade and are led by the Ouroboros Dragon God, Ophis. Hearing this sent a wave of shock and terror throughout everyone in the know. I remember seeing the name in our dragon archives, but didn't think much of it. Ikigo said, thinking back on a book of draconic mythical figures. So how worried should we be, he asked aloud, for the biblical factions to hear, but he was really asking one being in particular. His oaken scar throbbed as the Soul King's voice rang in his mind. Afis itself is regarded as the embodiment of infinite for a reason. However, treat them as a child. They isolated itself and never truly grew up, remaining as innocent and naive as children. The real concern is whoever is trying to manipulate them. The Soul King's voice faded as Ikigo returned his full focus to the current meeting where they decided to inform the other mythological factions of the terrorists, but still had to show their own unity first. So no, I'm off the table and already have a fiancé in mind, Seraphal declared, glaring at Azazel. But think about how it looks politically. The fallen angel returned. A Satan and any one of the Ang, he was cut off when Shemhazai whacked him in the head. Sorry about him. The truth is I myself am married to a devil, and he knew that. 
the fallen angel announced, much to everyone's surprise while Azazel was having a laugh. Why did you have to ruin my fun Shemhezai? Because I don't enable your worst tendencies, and you know that. Well that settles matters between the devils and the fallen, Ikigo said, but what about the angels and D? I offer myself to marry Issei, Irina suddenly shouted, rather enthusiastically, making everyone look at her in surprise as she wore a growing blush. I, I mean, if he and Reyes are okay with it. That wouldn't be a bad option, Sir Zekus admitted. The Grimmery are an influential family and Issei, being the Red Dragon Emperor, will certainly become a major player in devil politics later on down the line. Ooh, okay, Reyes said while Issei was still processing Irina's declaration and thinking something perverted. But why though? Irina's expression shifted to one of shame now. Truthfully, Issei, ever since we were kids I had a crush on you. She admitted, surprising the boy in question. And I was elated to see you again, until I found out you became a devil. And a huge pervert. Issei felt the word slam into his head. It was easy to bury it under a sense of betrayal, like my friend turned his back on me. But, Oraheim revealed otherwise. The exorcist walked up to Issei. I betrayed you. I let hate and prejudice keep us from reconnecting and making amends. She stood before him, throwing her arms out and opening her cloak to reveal her tight combat bodysuit. To do that now, I offer myself in this political union to strengthen the alliance of the factions and grant you permission to vent all of your frustrations onto my body. She said, blushing the whole time. Whoa, Jack! he yelled before getting punched in the head by Rias as she got between him and Arena. Down boy, she ordered. And you, wait your turn, I've got dibs. She told the exorcist, turning and sitting in Issei's lap. Okay, I guess that settled that. Ikigo said, thanking everything he was calmer at that age. Although, I was going to bring up the possibility of whether or not the Grigori would still be a separate faction. What do you mean? Azazel asked as the three fallen angels looked to the hybrid. What if the new god apologizes for your banishment? What if you're accepted back into the heavenly host? They'd probably consider you as a valuable consult and advisor since you're all more in touch with humanity than the other angels. Really the only thing that seems to separate your two groups are a color scheme and a disagreement that you're both coming around on. That made the three fallen and the two seraphs look to each other. That, DMN, that makes sense. Azazel admitted as Michael rose to his feet and walked over to the fallen. I'd be elated to welcome you back my brothers, he said with a smile, with Azazel keeping him at arm's length. Boundaries Michael. Get a rack like Gabriel's and maybe we'll hug. They were brought back to the meeting as they heard Sersechs and Seraphal laughing. This is the most entertaining meeting I've ever been a part of, he said, smiling in good cheer as the mood slowly affected everyone. I'm not entirely sure how much is getting done, but it's certainly far more interesting. I can only hope telling those old codgers back home that I'm going to make a serious effort with marrying Ikigo will be a tenth as fun, Seraphal said between laughs, stopping when the temperature suddenly dropped. Literally. Ah, I forgot to mention that, Oraheim said, turning and doing apologetic bows to Rukia. Sorry Rukia, first wife and chairwoman of the Brides of Ikigo. It slipped my mind to mention this at our monthly meeting. Rukia sighed as the temperature returned to normal. Seraphal Leviathan. The captain started, making the Satan straighten up unconsciously. Three days after this, we will be having a meeting. You will meet the other sister wives and you will make your case as to whether or not you will be accepted. Seraphal nodded while everyone else turned their eyes on Ikigo. Yeah, they've been like that ever since I finished my training in Dunscaife. He told them. I don't argue, I just accept it. I'm too busy to really dictate my love life. Don't complain about having a HRM you lucky. Issei was shouting before his face was hit with a ball of blue energy that wrapped around his head and turned into a RBB face mask. I was being lenient before, but what he was saying had nothing to add to anything. Ikigo said with a finger pointing at Issei as the Gremory peerage was trying, and failing, to get the elastic Kaido off their friend. Sir Zeches, you can free his nostrils so that he can breathe, and hurry, I don't think he can afford any brain damage. Sir Zekis proceeded to do just that, creating a thin line of destruction magic to carve out the necessary holes to let his prospective brother-in-law breath. 
As he did, Gabriel raised her hand. Miss Rukia Kurosaki, may I join Sarah Fall in that meeting? She asked, surprising everyone. Ize almost lost his nose because of that. I don't know what I might be able to offer personally, but I can at least serve as the political bond with the angels. So, you don't care to marry out of love? Rukia asked, feeling annoyed while Gabriel looked confused. But I do love him. I love everyone, she said with a smile, making Ikigo and Rukia compare her to Oriheim back when his HRM was just starting. She's too innocent, they thought as Seraphal stood up. Now hang on you. She started angry but seemed to trail off in thought. Actually, I'm good with that, she said with a thumbs up and a bloody nose. What was she thinking? Some of the group thought as Ajuka took a stand now. Well, now that we've decided on solidifying some political alliances, I've got a few questions for the Gotai. If I may Ikigo, he asked, Ikigo nodding to the Satan. Can you explain why and how you had both the Citri and Gremory peerages bugged for the past three years? As he asked that, all the other devils froze with the angels looking shocked as well. But the members of the Gotai didn't betray any emotion. I noticed it whenever I saw either of them, but it was so unfamiliar that I was having a strong time really determining the how. There wasn't anything on them, nothing mechanical or magical, and it seemed like it was inside them somehow. A theory that was confirmed in Sona's and Riaz's report that they received a text on their phone telling them about Selzin's ambush. Sir Sech's and Seraphal's expressions turned to angry stone while the Gremory and Citri peerages looked horrified. When I tried to have a sample recovered from them, I failed to find anything I could use for research. Yeah, we bugged them. Ikigo casually admitted. A nifty invention of one of our scientists called surveillance bacteria that they ingested. Usually with some treat Oraheim made or from some of the spiked candy Kaneko got from her mascot work with Soul Dragon Candy, one of our living world businesses. The Gremory and Citri peerages were trembling at how vulnerable they felt now. Designed to self-destruct and degrade completely once it sensed being outside of the body and were completely benign, only used for surveillance. Although I suppose he could alter them to be more like probiotics. Do you mind sharing a sample? Echuka asked, making the other Satans look at him incredulously. It seems like it'll be incredibly useful for keeping tabs on the Great King faction. Ikigo released a groan of disgust. Those old-fashioned purebred FCK still trying to be a nuisance? He asked before sighing. Don't you have enough evidence to disprove any of their claims? Sadly no, otherwise I wouldn't be asking for a sample. Ugh. Fine. We'll supply you the means to use it but leave the actual bugging to me. I'm certain my stealth forces are better than what the devils can field. Ajika nodded in acquiescence to the claim as Ikigo returned his attention to Serzeches and Seraphal. No, I will not in any way apologize for putting your sisters under such strict surveillance. You put them in my country, I know how big a siskin the two of you are, I wasn't going to take the chance of them getting hurt and you two rampaging throughout the human realm like wild beasts I'd need to put down. I believe you, he pointed to Seraphal, said, my favorite berry wouldn't let anything dangerous actually happen. Remember? The two Satans released a sigh as they agreed. Thank you for watching over them. Sertsech said, though I would appreciate it if you removed that bacteria. Already taken care of. They ate cookies with an antibiotic in the frosting. That's why we didn't get the leftovers, Kaneko said, understanding but more upset about being denied the cookies anyway. That reminds me. Zenovia, Ikigo said to the Soul Reaper trainee, who brought over the briefcases. Like I said, I'll turn over the research and Excaliburs after we removed anything that would have compromised the Soul Society. Also, a few of my researchers decided to take a crack at the swords and the crystals. Zenovia opened up one case, revealing dozens of blue jean crystals that Valper discovered, earning gasps of shock from all parties. Completely artificial synthesized crystals, with an estimated potency of three times the latest version Valper made. Not a single scrap of a gene was taken from anyone else to make them. Zenovia then pulled out another case, unlatched a side, and slid it open to reveal three sword pommels, pulling out each one to reveal an Excalibur that Cockabeel stole. She did the same with a few others, revealing more Excaliburs, regular fragments and mixed fragments. We may have gone a tad overboard. This, this is very generous Ikigo. 
Michael said, pinching himself at the veritable treasure trove that the head captain just handed over. Heaven is still the worst off of you three. This is to help level the playing field until God is reborn. Ikigo explained. Besides, maintaining peace is one part friendly relations and one part war deterrence, and I'm going to station more Gotai agents in Kyo to deter anyone that plans on starting a war in my territory. That statement made Rhea shoot to her feet. Lord Kurosaki, Kyo is my, she tried to say before the entire room was caught in a suffocating atmosphere. All the air shot from her lungs and all she saw was Ikigo's stare. It was not angry, it held no contempt. She couldn't even gasp for air or move as each of her peerage fell around her. If you cannot even breath, why did you think you could talk? She heard as her vision began to black out before the pressure faded and the room filled with the sounds of gasping while she fell in a heap. Ria's was always confident in her brother's power, but with that display of Ikigo's she began to doubt if even he could defeat the monstrous hybrid. Sir Sechus, I just remembered you didn't tell me who you were nominating as the new overseer of Kuo. The Lucifer flinched while Seraphal and Grafia sighed. You didn't tell Rias she was fired, did you? Wa? Rias could only groan while Oreheim, Grafia, Irina, and Zenovia helped them all back into their chairs. Her brother sighed as he could no longer stall. Reyes, in accordance to our agreement with Soul Society, Head Captain Ikigo Kurosaki deemed you ill-suited to the position of overseer of the Kyo area and you have been dismissed. He finally said, the words feeling like ash on his tongue, and refusing to look at his sister. Your replacement will be Sona Citri of the Citri household. You are still permitted to be in Kyo, but Sona is now in command. Sona stood, but everyone could see her trembling. I, I, I w will d do my bb best as o of overseer she said, still dealing with the aftermath of Ikigo's Riyatsu. There's one more question I have Ikigo, Ajuka said. I noticed it around the same time you informed us about God's rebirth, but where are we right now? When he asked that, the leaders just then noticed they didn't feel the magic of their barrier anymore. I moved the meeting to the shadow side of Kyo, Ikigo said, using Fulbring on the curtains to reveal a completely empty space. Like Shemhazai explained with the Kao's brigade, I suspected that some folks that were less than thrilled about the peace summit would have made their moves and attacked us. Like some old Satan faction members, overzealous exorcists, or the more bloodthirsty members of the Grigori. Uriu pulled out a box with a button. However, if we've settled everything we came here to do, then I declare this meeting over. All in favor? He asked, getting a resounding eye. Uriu pressed the button and they watched the window and the darkness faded away replaced by a gray film over everything and blood-stained ruined landscape as the four sterneters were holding off an endlessly spawning army of robed figures and devils with spirit arrows. Azazel asked the question most everyone was thinking. What the hell did we miss? Uriu pulled out a radio that was connected to earpieces with each sterneter. Report. He ordered, getting a bit of static before Lil Tato's voice came through. Hey boss, after we sent you guys off, these robed figures showed up and appear to have taken the vamp kid to use his sacred gear to freeze everyone. Hearing that seemed to have kick started the recovery of the Gremory group as they gasped and rose to their feet. Gasper, how dare they target my servant like this? Rias roared in anger with her red aura leaking out only to get an icy finger trailing down her neck, courtesy of Rukia. Calm down. You can't rescue your servant if you go in guns blazing and without a plan, no matter how strong your team is. The captain scolded as the report continued, the Gremory heiress forcing herself to calm down. Then this skank calling herself Cunty Leviathan, I could have gotten that name wrong, showed up demanding where you guys were. Kataria Leviathan, Sir Sechus said in disappointment. So they really are turning against us. Only thing we got out of her before the fight was some world domination bullshit. I managed to get the devil and angel guards out of danger since they were frozen and the only real problem is that one beach. Can I eat? No, I'm starving. She asked, earning incredulous looks from everyone except for those that knew her. Uriu released a sigh. Let's try and capture the Leviathan if we can, kill the rest. The Quincy ordered as he turned to Volley. You wanna join me out there? You look pretty bored right now. The white dragon looked to Asazel, who gave him an approving nod with Barakiel joining the Quincy leader. 
Volley smiled as they rushed out with the dragon sprouting some kind of blue energy wings, almost obscuring the sight of a pair of jaws stretching out and biting through anything that was between the teeth while the air was filled with the cackling of electricity, the booms of explosions, and the sounds of crashing. What was formerly a stalemate between the four Quincy and the endless terrorists shifted into a one-sided slaughter. Okay, while they take care of that, do you want to save your little vampire? Ikigo asked snapping the Gremory members from the horrific slaughter. Bambi was fighting a few devils, now blowing people to bits. Candace was frying them with electricity. Meninas was tearing them apart with raw strength. And Liltado was eating everything as Uryu now fought a tan-skinned woman with long brown hair wearing glasses and a rather revealing dress. The odd thing Ikigo and the other spiritually aware noted was that her power seemed to feel mixed in an odd way. Of course. Rias declared as the rest of the Gremory peerage stood by her side. All of my household is precious to me and my own. Irina looked to Michael, asking permission to join them as she took one of the crystals and an Excalibur. Now wielding her mimic and a rapid transparency in the form of broadsword with hole in the guard and a protrusion in the back. The angel nodded as Irina smiled and joined the Gremory group. While Azazel gave Issei a couple rings he claims could help him control the boosted gear and forbidden valor view. Very well, Rukia show them the way. The commander ordered his wife as he opened a garganta. Rukia stepped forward, creating a platform of rice heat. Zenovia, did you wish to join them? He asked the trainee as she wordlessly manifested the Durandal and joined the group. Follow me and stay close. If you fall off, there's no coming back. Rukia declared as she sprinted off, the group of teens following her and making sure to stay on the manifested walkway. Aren't you planning to head out yourself? Azazel asked Ikigo as Grafia was serving the remaining members another round of tea. Uryu can handle this. I don't want to ruin their fun so early. Old school building. The group of teens walked out of another tier in space, infiltrating the enemy territory and comparing the Garganta to their normal method of teleporting. Kiba summoned a holy demon sword, Akino SWCH to shrine maiden clothes, and Issei had out his gauntlet to start raising his strength. Kiba and Kaneko took point, leading the group down the hall, Irina and Zenovia were in the back in case of an attack from behind, while Issei, Riaz, Akino, and Asia were in the center. Here you go. Good luck. Rukia said, already walking away from the group, much to their surprise. What are you going to do? Issei asked. To assist my allies. That's my priority, just like saving that vampire is your priority. She said before flashing away. The group looked to each other and nodded before bolting down the hall. As they ran they saw the chaos erupting around the school grounds, the veteran devils watching Kataria and Uryu fight with black energy serpents and blades of blue, while Issei watched Volley at work. They kept going until Zenovia spoke up. Third room on the right, she called out. That's where the most energy is located, choosing to trust their ally. Ria's ordered Issei to promote to Queen so that he, Kaneko, and Kiba could make the entrance. They broke down the door but didn't enter, growling in frustration at seeing Gasper tied to a chair with a dagger to his neck in a room filled with the robed figures. Senpai, Kaneko, he called out as the rest of the group showed up. Everyone, I, I'm sorry. He hung his head in despair and shame. Just... Just kill me. I'm nothing but a burden. He begged, breaking the hearts of his household. You'd be better off with... Stop talking like that, Ria's ordered, having enough with losses for the day. You're my servant, my family, and I refuse to abandon you. All I do is cause trouble, so don't bother with... He argued back when suddenly the magician on his right was cut across the back. Irina appearing with the rapid transparency Excalibur in hand before moved the other forward as the Excalibur mimic turned into a spear and stabbed the other magician in the throat. The rest of the peerage were just as shocked before leaping into action. The magician stood no chance. Okay Gasper, let's get you out of that. Akino said, stepping forward before noticing the spell at his feet. Ah, so that's how they were doing it. And there's a barrier that Gasper is powering, he can't move from this spot. The queen groaned as she got to work trying to figure out how to undo it. Please, just kill me and get it over with, the vampire begged again. If you don't, everyone will. Dude, shut up, Issei roared out. You're one of us, precious friends of the House of Gremory. You can't ask for a more loving household and MSTR than the Prez. 
We won't kill you or abandon you just because you feel like a burden. He held up his gauntlet and called out a blade, the dragon slayer sword Escalon that he got from Michael. And as a man, if you don't like something, you change it. Issei dragged the tip of his index finger across the blade and cut himself, surprising the rest of the peerage. Now come on. Power up and let's end this together. Drink up. The dragon shouted before shoving his finger into the vampire's mouth. His body pulsed and his eyes flashed before exploding into a swarm of bats, overpowering and destroying the seal that held him in place. He reformed seconds later, with a time freeze fully dispelled. I know Azazel suggested it, but I didn't think it'd be that effective. Issei said as he pulled out one of the two bracelets while Asia healed his finger. Now Gasper, I don't want to ever hear you talk like that again. Rhea said, scolding the vampire. I want you to cause trouble, so I can scold you lots, then hug you even more. Because you're precious to me. She said before hugging her timid bishop. That hug was soon joined by Akino and Kaneko, while Issei and Kiba just held his shoulders in solidarity. Now let's get out of, Reyes was cut off by the sound of thunder, causing everyone to rush to the window again, and seeing Oryu with his hands ablaze in Raizhi, lightning striking around them, and Kataria falling to the ground, missing her wings and an arm. With Oryu. The squad 15 captain watched impassively as the devil fell, burned and smoking from the lightning she was struck with. The fight was a non-issue for him, using the Almighty to stay ahead of every move she tried to make against him, and all the magic that was used saturated the area with Ryze that he took full advantage of. He led her around until Candace was underneath and then allowed her to believe she caught him by turning her arm into a tentacle snare around him, boasting that she couldn't be cut. That claim was disproved as he manifested a blade of Ryze that slid through her arm like a knife through water and later her wings, just to add insult to injury. With that done, Candace unleashed a high-voltage lightning bolt on the devil, stunning and frying her into unconsciousness, leaving her vulnerable for Lil Tato to gobble up. And successfully captured Uryu thought as he drained the rise he in the magic gate, disabling it while still maintaining the Almighty, waiting for the actual threat. Now, here he comes, he thought before flashing away, causing Volley to miss as he attempted to tackle the Quincy. For the record, everyone in the Gotai has the ability to sense spiritual power, which is the basis for most everything. He explained to the dragon, now clad in his white balance breaker armor, who he guessed was looking at him in excitement. I kept track of you as you helped fight the magicians, then punched out Barakil. Not surprising honestly. What, can you see the future? Vali asked, not serious but enjoying the banter. I paid attention to you during the meeting, Uryu explained. You were excited to hear about God's return. You kept evaluating Ikigo every time Sir Zexus and Michael showed him respect, but were especially excited when he showed off his Riyatsu to that Gremory girl, and Oraheim told us about the last time she saw you. You aren't the first battle nut she's met, just a bit more subtle about it. Pretty clear you were the traitor that caused this attack. Volley had the nerve to laugh. What can I say, peace is boring, but I don't care for conquest like Kataria did. Neither does off eyes. The dragon claimed as everyone started gathering in the courtyard. I just crave battle. How juvenile. I'm going to attack now. Block it. Uryu warned before flashing in front of Volley with a giant made of rise he in hand and the almighty disable. Volley was thrown off by the honesty of Uryu's move and moved an arm to block the moment he saw Uryu's red glowing BLD vessels. Grunting at the force pushed him back a little. I'm also guessing you're severely disappointed in Issei as a rival. Then how about this? I can arrange you to have a fight with Ikigo if you can push Issei to get stronger. Volley's mask betrayed no emotion, but the lack of movement told Uryu he had Volley's attention. And here's a hint on how to do that. With everyone else. I suspected, but didn't want to believe it. Azazel said, as the whole of the peace summit bore witness, they all gathered in the courtyard, the last of the invading terrorists slain, watching the battle. Barakil informed them of Vali's betrayal and was being tended to by Asia as Oryu made a move that Vali blocked. Hey, is that Quincy going to be alright? No one else is going to die today. Ikigo said as if it was the destined truth. Besides, Oriheim can patch him up. So I've heard. You sure that girl doesn't possess as sacred gear? Azazel asked gaining an interest in Soul Society's abilities. Yeah, besides, sacred gears are boring. 
the hybrid said, earning a shocked look from everyone that didn't personally know him. Volley then flashed as Uryu was struck by a beam of light, cutting off his arm, then kicking the Quincy down to the group. Oraheim had Ventus catch him, before letting him down and immediately restoring his arm. Sorry Azazel, but everything about this is dull, Volley called out. Peace between the factions? You've always encouraged me to get stronger, but how can I in a peaceful world? And you, Ize Hayato, you're the embodiment of disappointing to me. What do you mean, Ize demanded, walking forward and glaring up at Volley. I was born powerful, a descendant of the original Devil King, you were born the most subpar human. Volley taunted. I know we're supposed to be contradictory to each other, but I never expected my destined rival to be so weak. Issei growled as he felt his anger build. Getting mad? Maybe this might make you interesting, become an Avenger. What are you getting at Volley? I'll give you a reason to hate me with all your guts. I'll take away everything you love here and now because you can't stop me. I'll kill your parents, your friends, but first. He paused, as if he couldn't believe what he was about to say. I'll take away the melons of the whole Gremory peerage, starting with Rias. He yelled out, sounding embarrassed about that threat. What? Virtually everyone asked as they tried to understand what Volley just said. Issei was utterly stunned. Th. That. That's not possible. He muttered, looking to Azazel, tears in his eyes as he refused to believe something so vile could be done. Right? He begged. Well, actually. The fallen angel started, breaking Issei's hope. The vanishing dragon does have an ability called Half Dimension, which can warp the space he's in and reduce everything by half. So yeah, he could do exactly that. There was a pause as the bracelet around Issei's arm flashed as he was clad in his balance breaker armor. The veterans of the Godai shot out their hands and manifested a massive spirit barrier, caging the two dragons together as Issei roared in fury with his power skyrocketing. Seriously? Because he threatened melons, Ikigo asked, shocked that this is happening over melons. There's nothing Issei loves more than my sisters and chest in general. Sursechus answered as the other leaders added their power to the barrier. Volley, Issei roared as he shot at his rival, instantly tackling the white dragon and punching him. Volley immediately used his power to divide Issei's, but the manic melon lover still packed enough strength to crack both their armors with that attack. With each punch he threw, Issei swore to protect the melons of each member of the Gremory peerage until they both landed on the ground and Volley's armor fell apart. All that, just because I threatened some useless lumps of meat, Volley said, chuckling as he got back to his feet and purposefully goading Issei on even further. How interesting. Issei saw a cracked blue ball, a piece of Volley's armor, and dove for it. Never insult the greatness of melons, he roared, getting ready to fuse the gem with his own armor, only to suddenly feel his brain shake as a blow to his chin spun him around before falling unconscious the armor dispelling and the bracelet falling apart. And that's enough of that, Ikigo said, his own fist glowing with power, before turning to Volley. That's your cue to leave. Volley merely laughed. I. He was immediately cut off as his head was blown off before he could manifest his armor again. Or at least, that's what he thought happened. The truth was that Ikigo immediately flashed behind him and pulled out his witch kit, a tool from Wingbind made to battle dragons, which was shaped like a black flintlock pistol with white horns akin to his own hollow forms at the end of the barrel, and blue flames on the grip. He was stunned, both his battle instincts and Albion himself was telling him that Ikigo would end him the instant he did anything. And considering the beating he took from Issei, he couldn't think of any way out of this that didn't end without him either dead or severely crippled. Volley he heard someone say as everyone else saw a magic seal appear with a figure dressed in light Chinese armor coming out, wielding a staff. Next thing anyone noticed was another Ikigo appearing above him and kicking the guy in the head, sending him slamming down before Volley before yet another Ikigo appeared before him with his gun under Volley's chin and his foot on the other guy's neck. It was so fast, no one could even move. New guy, name and why you're here. The captain demanded, keeping an eye on the guy's staff while the two speed clones disappeared. B. Biku, the descendant of Sun Wukong Ah, he cried out as Ikigo applied more pressure on the now identified monkey Yaokai for moving his staff just slightly. I, I came to get volley. Ikigo hummed before pressing more down on Biku. Gah, 
The cow's brigade are about to fight the Norse gods and I came to get him. Ikigo hummed again before pointing the gun to Vali's chest and shooting. Just enough power to send Vali flying back before kicking Biku into the dragon. Now get out of my country. The hybrid ordered. Next time you cause a mess like this again, I won't be so lenient. He warned as Biku quickly cast a teleportation spell and vanished. Ikigo put his gun away and flashed back to Issei, where Oraheim was examining him with the rest of the peerage crowding around. What's the diagnosis, Heim? Just exhaustion. Nothing to really worry about. The teacher said, letting Ria's cradle her pawn to her chest. Nice timing when you knocked him out. Azazel said as he, Serzekis, and Michael came over. Though I'll admit, I did want to see him try to fuse with that frag. He was silenced as Ikigo punched him in the head. If you were less focused on sacred gears and more about managing your group, you would have noticed Vali's betrayal sooner. Ikigo scolded while the fallen angel nursed his new lump. Ikigo then repeated the same action with Sirsetches. The next time one of the old Satan group pulls a stunt like that in Japan, I'll storm the Devil Netherworld personally and wipe out every adult descendant of the old Satan faction. All right, sorry about that. Sirsetch said while Grafia took the role of a concerned wife, NRSNG her husband's lump. Now, with everything settled on our end, we're leaving. Ikigo said, opening a garganta for him and the rest of his group. One of you keep me up to date with this. Bakao's brigade is a threat we all must face. They began to leave before Lil Tato stopped and turned around. I almost forgot. She said before her mouth grew to titanic sizes and coughed out the angels and devils that Michael, Azazel, and Sir Seches brought with them. Kept them safe in my non-digestive storage stomach when the Kao's brigade attacked. You're welcome. She said before running to join her group. That was gross. Kaneko said while everyone else shuddered. Underscore 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 Yeah, I'm a Christian and I'm letting my bias opinion on God come in. So we get a united biblical faction. Deal with it. The Soul King is one of the primordial entities since his mythos states that he protected the first denizens of the world from the primordial hollows. So of course he would know about Ophi's, Great Red, and Trihexia. After getting a Yama stare, Rias is now going to get her head out of her butt and swallow that pride by training herself now. This A will need a bit more work. I'm of the belief that much of the magic in DXD still uses a form of Rise Hiroyoku, so the Quincy can actually be anti-magic troops. How did Ikigo bitch slap Volley with ease? Even when sealed enough so that he can be in the world of the living, he's among the top 10 strongest beings. When not holding back, he's in the top 5. I'd argue Uryu and Kenpachi Zaraki could be on that list too, but Uryu can't perpetually use the Almighty like Ihwach could and Zaraki would be in on sheer power but lacks the same divine durability that would put him around Thor's level. He's still the strongest and toughest Shinigami, even Ikigo still has a strong time fighting him. Enough reviews and support, and I'll show you what Seraphal was thinking about in the next chapter. Underscore 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 omic. Oreo's specific advice. Threaten melons. The Quincy said, causing Volley to retract his face mask. Huh? he asked, using the only word he could actually form at the moment. I know, it sounds dumb, but threaten melons. Threaten to take away the melons of his peerage, specifically Riaz's. Threatening to kill his friends and family won't have nearly the same impact. There was a pause. Please say you're joking. I wish I was. Zenovia's new sleeping arrangements. All right, trainee, Karen called out walking to Zenovia's dorm room in the Silburn Fortress. Time to get back. 2. Zenovia had nothing to her room at the moment beyond a desk, bed, a closet filled with training uniforms, her Asuachi, and the Durandal, so Karin wasn't expecting much. 
but she wasn't expecting to find Zenobia cuddling with the large holy sword like it was a body pillow. Sorry. Neglected. Love you. She heard the girl mumble as she sleepily rubbed her face against the flat of the sword. This is actually kind of sweet, Karin decided. In a weird way. She let this go on for another five seconds, before kicking the bed frame so strong it flipped. Zenovia woke with a shout as the bed fell on top of her. Get up. Training starts now. Issei remembered something. The Gremory and Citri peerages were in the student council room, doing the paperwork to officially name Sona as the new overseer of Kuo, with Oriheim overseeing the process. After the fight, Issei needed a whole day just to be able to move again. Now that he was, Asia and Kiba were explaining what happened to Issei. And everything was settled peacefully. Thank God. Ah, Asia prayed before getting a sharp pain in her head, seeing that clicked something in Issei's head. Ah, he cried out, surprising everyone in the room. I forgot to talk to Michael about Asia. Ah, uh, about what? The former priestess asked, reeling from Issei's outburst. About your banishment, and if he could make it so you could pray without getting headaches, he kept yelling, raging about Volley and the Kato's brigade making him forget things in the heat of battle, cursing out Ikigo for knocking him out for the rest of Michael's stay. While he did that, Oraheim took out her cell and texted this very matter to her husband. Ikigo's got a direct line to Michael. He said he'd ask for you. She said, after receiving a text back. I'm still mad about it, Issei returned. First steps to a new era. Squad 1, Ikigo's office. The good news is that they managed to push back the Kalos brigade and Odin was willing to listen to me explain the full situation. Azazel said, talking to Ikigo through a similar projector that Michael and Serzech has used and keeping the promise of informing Ikigo of the present situation. They agreed to attend a meeting of the various faction leaders when the time comes, an invite I'm extending to every other connection I have. I'm hoping to hear back from Olympus and Svarga soon, Zeus and Indra can be a real pain to deal with. Word of the peace summit, the resulting treaty being called the Kyo Accord, and the reveal of the Kalos Brigade was spreading throughout the world at a rapid rate. Pretty soon the mythical world would find itself embroiled in war, so it was vital to build alliances and weed out the potential threats as soon as they could. I passed through Greece seven years ago when I was training, try mentioning me and see if that gets you anywhere. The hybrid suggested, idly wondering if Demeter and Aphrodite were still mad at him. Never got to India so I can't say I really know any of the major Hindu figures. That's when he felt his oaken scar pulsate as the Soul King spoke to him. Can't you circumvent Indra and just aim for any of the triumvirate? Stopping the Kao's brigade should attract Vishnu's attention at the very least since he's the preserver and all, or am I missing something about that? Again, never met that group. Azazel put a hand to his chin as he thought. That might help to get that faction to show up, but would definitely make things harder with Indra. The angel admitted. He's not the strongest of that faction, but is still the leader and also a bit of an egomaniac. He once tried fighting the biblical god because he didn't like anyone else being called the ruler of heaven. That didn't end so well for him. And on that note we should probably keep God's rebirth a secret from him. Still, we should do whatever to get them to attend. Ikigo argued back. Like I said, the Kaos Brigade isn't something we can just ignore. If Indra chooses to ignore that, then he's a fool. All right, I'll give that a try, but in exchange I want you to deal with Indra if he's going to be a nuisance at the meeting. Fine, keep me up to date on any other attendees you guys think of. Also, when can Soul Society expect their copy of your sacred gear research notes? Ikigo asked earning a somewhat mocking smirk from Azazel. I thought you considered sacred gears boring. To me, they are. Ikigo admitted with no hesitation. There's a difference between boring and non-threatening, and I didn't dismiss the threat they represent. At that, Azazel nodded in agreement. At least you're aware of their potential, even if you don't care for them. The fallen angel said with a smile, I'll be having one of my men send it to the Soul Dragon candy shop in Kuo. Thank you. See you again later. Ikigo said as he ended the call, the projection fading to reveal Uryu sipping away at some tea with eyes in the almighty state before blinking and returning to normal. What now? The captain commander asked as the Quincy leader set his tea down with a smile. Good news. Nothing we need to really prepare for. 
Uryu said, taking a huge weight off of Ikigo's shoulders. The only really major thing is a raiding game tournament among the current generation of young devils like Ria's and Sona. I see you attending since you end up engaged to Seraphal. Ikigo hummed in approval as Kagatora came into the room with a few dossiers, the personnel and volunteers that he was thinking of sending to Kuo. I also think I saw a dragon attacking you, but the more important thing was a familiar face, a student of yours that decided to misbehave. A few names crossed Ikigo's mind when Oryu said that, the Pendragon siblings and Jean, the child that inherited the spirit of the Maiden of Orleans. I suppose I'll be showing whichever brat that is some DSPLN then, the hybrid said, looking over the names on the files and what roles they'd be likely to play. A silence fell over the cousins as Uryu seemed to be waiting for something that Ikigo was stalling on. Seriously? That's what you told Volley to do? The dam finally broke as they groaned and growled in frustrated disbelief. What the actual FCK is wrong with Issei? We read the same reports, but I never actually thought it'd be that bad, Uryu whined, slumped over the table. And I keep seeing it popping up in some way. That dress break move can be useful for removing armor at the very least but I've seen him create a move to actually talk to Melons. Ikigo let out another groan, smacking his head on his desk while Kagatora felt her eye twitching. Captain, allow me to punish this enemy of all women, she said, reaching for her Zampakuto as it turned into a long spear with seven-pronged blades. Such lust can only be considered evil towards women. Down Kagatora, Ikigo immediately ordered in a tired voice, he's not evil, just stupid. I checked. The lieutenant hesitated, but ultimately reverted her blade back to its sealed state and sheathed it. If that kid's going to play a vital role in the future, we need to make sure he can actually play that role. He can, but I don't think we should have to suffer the full potential idiocy of the Opai Dragon. Both Ikigo and Nagao looked to Uryu in disbelief. I wish I was joking. We can mitigate it, but the only way to stop it completely is to find a new host for the boosted gear. Let's call that plan B. The hybrid decided as he went back to reading the dossiers. Kyoto Castle. So, these are the other girls. The Leviathan Satan thought as she scanned the women in the changing room. Seraphal and Gabriel arrived in the city on the third day after the QOP summit as per Rukia's instruction to meet with their prospective sister wives. After they left the train station they were immediately intercepted by some yaokai who led the two of them to where the HRM of the Shogun were gathered into the realm of the Yaokai and to the baths of Yasaka's castle. Rukia's order as the leading wife of the HRM was that they bathe together, bonding in skinship and bearing everything to one another. They're not lacking for size, that's for certain. She thought as her eyes drifted to each one's different assets as they undressed. The first was the sizable busts of Yasaka, Tyr Haribol, Nilial, and Oraheim, with only Yasaka having any sag to her chest, as minor as it was. Seraphal guessed that was due to most of them practicing swordplay while Yasaka was definitely more of a mage type. And he'll be getting another nice pair soon. She thought as she looked at Gabriel's chest, an urge to reach out and fondle them bubbling inside of her while the angel in question hummed happily, oblivious to Seraphal's growing longing. She shook her head and went back to sizing up the other women. Not to say the rest are small either. She checked out the rest of the HRM. Esdef, Bambietta, Candace, and Tatsuki. Her eyes drank in their more toned figures until they drifted to Senna and Rukia. Well, maybe those two are. I'm heading in first. Can someone get my back? Rukia asked as she went into the baths first, Seraphal getting a full view of the Shinigami captain's butt, as Bambietta offered to help Rukia. That was a nice butt. The devil thought as they finished their stripping and went into baths. Each girl seemed to pair up as they washed their bodies, Bambietta getting Rukia's back. Candice and Haribol washing their hair, Esdeth and Tatsuki more focused on their musculature and comparing their workout progress, Nell and Senna basically playing with the water and soap, and Oraheim and Yasaka talking about the kids having their playtime together. While Gabriel was marveling at the size of the baths, the calming herbal scent and atmosphere, Seraphal gained a predatory look to her eyes as she placed a hand on the angel's shoulder. Come on, I'll help you wash up, she said with a sincere smile. Ah, thanks Seraphal, Gabriel said with an innocent smile as they went to one of the showers. The two sat next to each other as they washed away any dirt and sweat from their bodies before moving on to applying shampoo and conditioner to their hair. 
Seraphal finished first while Gabriel was giving thanks to God for this pleasant experience and Seraphal's kindness. The Satan had to ignore the spike of pain as she got behind the seraph and started scrubbing away. Wow Gabriel, your skin feels so smooth. Seraphal noted as she washed the angel. Is this an angel thing to be so naturally soft? That was a genuine question on her part, though her hands did start to drift ever so slightly to Gabriel's chest. Hmm, not to my knowledge. She admitted, not noticing Seraphal's wandering feelers. But my body was a gift to me by my lord, so I should try and cherish it every day. She said with a smile, before letting out a surprised gasp as Seraphal took hold of her voluptuous mounds. Seraphal, I already got my front. Gabriel said, not trying to stop the devil as her soapy hands rubbed the underside of her chest as her body began to tingle a little. Just making sure. Seraphal countered while bearing a cat-like smile, mixing in a BRST massage as she washed Gabriel's melons and playing with them to her heart's content. You wouldn't believe how much sweat can accumulate under our big boobies. W well, I guess that's true ah, she gasped in shocked delight as Seraphal pushed a finger into both of her nubs. I don't think those were dirty Seraphal. You sure? I thought they were inverted from how easily they took me in. The devil continued as she rotated her fingertips, buried in Gabriel's nubs as the angel tried to hold in a mmm. She couldn't befoul the effort of a friend helping her wash with such an indecent sound, but there was only so much she could take. Then there was a whistle and a loud crack as a wood basin was thrown and smashed against Seraphal's head, breaking apart on impact with Seraphal now lying in a daze with BLDSQR out of her head and nose. Keep the pervy stuff in the bedroom, not the baths, Tatsuki scolded stomping over to the two before throwing Seraphal into a pool labeled cold baths. Not like I can talk though. The martial artist muttered under her breath as she rinsed Gabriel off while the angel was in shock at what happened to Seraphal before helping her into the main bath with the rest of the girls. Well, now that we're all here, it's time to call this meeting of the Brides of Ikigo to order. Rukia announced, substituting a gavel smack with her hand on the water. Rukia wasn't the first girl in their husband's collection of lovers, but she was the first bride. That and the other options were Oraheim or Tatsuki. Everyone agreed Rukia was the best choice since she had that mix of familiarity with everyone and the ability to keep order among the sister wives. Vice Chair Yasaka, please remind everyone of the purpose of this meeting. Yes, Chairwoman Rukia. The Yaokai Princess declared, Yasaka had the role of second in command since she had much of the same diplomatic leadership quality with greater experience but was still the newest bride out of the lot. During the QOP summit three days ago, the factions agreed to political marriages to strengthen the ties between the groups in attendance and included our Lord Shogun as a result. The devils presented the Satan, Seraphal Leviathan. See, can I PPP please J join you? They heard the devil ask as she stood up from the water her nubs irked and body shivering from the cold. I'm as sorry about what IDD did. Also, WW why is this pool so CCC cold? Another two minutes at least you horndog, Tatsuki answered. Besides, you should be thanking me. Hot to cold therapy does wonders for the BLD flow and feels great. You threw me in the cold bath, she angrily returned, forgetting the chill for a moment. I figured you needed a cool down first since you were so hot and bothered. Tatsuki teased with a smirk. That being said, I'm not kidding about alternating between hot and cold. I'm getting in that bath pretty soon. Seraphal pouted, but returned to the water and endured the polar plunge. And the angels presented the seraph, Gabriel. Yasaka continued as that ended. Attention went to the angel who gave everyone a kindly smile. I hope we can all get along and you take care of me as your newest sister," she said, somehow radiating light. An innocent face and personality with a body built for temptation. Candace suddenly said, making the angel gasp in shock before going teary-eyed, reminds me of you too. The electric Quincy said, pointing to Nell and Oraheim, both of whom pouted but couldn't protest since they remembered their forays into SXL debauchery. Is, is my body actually sinful? the angel asked, her light dimming as she hoped that her form wouldn't cause people to fall to sin. She was supposed to be a symbol of light and purity, not an idol of lust and depravity. As the girls saw this, Seraphal sprang into action to cradle Gabriel's head. No, it isn't, 
the devil quickly claimed, hugging the angel close to her. If anything, you can consider it as a tool to expose those weak to their lustful urges. Tyr calmly stated. Whether they give in or not is the test you can perform. Then you can, in turn, make them repent by exposing their weakness and guiding them back with your pure aura. Really? Gabriel asked, her light getting brighter again. Yeah, you're so appealing it actually makes me want to pray, Seraphal shouted as the angel looked hopeful. Do? Do you really mean that, Seraphal? The devil nodded, making the seraph smile before taking Seraphal's hands. Then let's join in prayer my sister, Seraphal nodded as the implications of what she said started to dawn on her, filling her with regret. Oh, okay, she said before they were both splashed with water. Save that for after the meeting, Rukia said as she tried to return to the matter at hand. Now, Gabriel, Seraphal already knows this, but there are rules until you are properly accepted into this group beyond being a trophy wife. Gabriel tilted her head in confusion while Seraphal sighed. And I've abided by these rules since we started dating. I've only ever embraced him on the cheek when appearances demanded it of us. We've never done anything SXL despite all of the PHRDS the elders have tried to drug us with. Seraphal explained. You know, none of you even explained why this was necessary. I figured, since there were ten of you, that you'd be more open-minded. For two major reasons, Seraphal, Yasaka said. One, you are both more loyal to your own factions instead of our husband. Even at the end of everything, if you were given an option, you would probably betray our trust if it meant furthering the devils. The Satan wanted to argue, even if what they said was true, that they were working on making sure that wouldn't be the case. Two, there was supposed to be eleven. Oraheim said as the mood darkened, Rukia, Tatsuki, and herself stealing their expressions. Ten years after it happened, and they still mourn their sister. Her name was Rangaku Matsumoto, Tatsuki said, taking over. She was basically the cheerful big sister of the group, sometimes lazy but was definitely an emotional rock if you needed one. Definitely could make a bad day seem decent just by her personality. But, she died during the Quincy BLD war ten years ago. Seraphal deflated, this being the first time she's ever heard of the death of any of Ikigo's lovers. Gabriel was on the verge of tears, sensing the sadness the others felt. Ikigo never really forgave himself for not being there, falling for an obvious trap that lured him away. Rukia continued. All the power that he possessed and a near flawless record, only for one day to remind him he's not all powerful and that we were too reliant on his strength. He still leaves dried persimmon offerings for her every year. That's why we're being more strict regarding any new sisters. Oriheim said, her voice gaining an edge. We don't want him to suffer through something like that ever again. Seraphal was about to speak up again before Oraheim continued. We're not questioning your strength, you being a Satan proves your power, but the risk is still present. Especially since your death, the death of any of us, would be more than enough reason for Ikigo to rampage. And considering his powers now, he'd probably erase whoever was responsible from existence. It wouldn't be the first time he did that. Tatsuki said, shocking the devil and angel. And it's not an exaggeration. Ever since he ended the BLD war, no one could recall the name of the first Quincy Emperor. Even the written records of his name were erased. No one should have that kind of power. Gabriel whispered, horrified that anything could do something like that. Seraphal seemed to take a moment to steal her resolve before standing in front of the HRM and summoning a parchment from a magic seal. She unfurled it and glowed with magical power. I, Seraphal Leviathan, swear upon my names of Citri and Leviathan to use this marriage to strengthen the bonds of friendship between the devils and soul society. She promised while the parchment now covered in devil script. I will hide nothing that could harm this union and any child I bear will be safe from the political games of those that would seek to manipulate my husband or myself. All this, so long as Ikigo responds in kind. The paper flashed as the magic set. Devils are bound by their contracts, so long as Ikigo does nothing to make himself an enemy of the devils and protects our children, I'll be as devoted a wife as he could ever wish. Rukia stood up and took the parchment, planning to have Ikigo and Oryu read it over since they actually knew the devil language. I'll be sure he gets this so you too can plan your whatever devils do for marriage ceremonies, she said before flashing to the changing room to put the contract with her clothes before flashing back to the baths. 
Gabriel watched Sarah fall, admiring the lengths she was willing to go there to honor this agreement and her future union with Kurosaki, while she questioned herself. Do. Do I have that same resolve? She thought as Sarah Fall was being more accepted into the group, planning out a dating schedule and getting to know the rest of the girls better. Could I make a similar oath? Do I have the right to? The Seraph thought as she remembered the utter devotion every non-fallen angel had towards God, that if her lord demanded it then she would betray Ikigo. Ikigo who, from the day he met Michael, was a valued friend to the angels as he revealed the truth of the hollows and how to cleanse them how he helped better arm heaven as a sign of trust in their building unity. That Ikigo was tough but ultimately fair as he treated both the angels and devils fairly, judging by actions to the whole rather than personal feelings. She shook her head, clearing her mind of doubts. Angels are supposed to protect and guide the just while punishing the wicked. And Ikigo Kurosaki is not wicked. She thought as she moved to join the group. He is a righteous man. Soul Society, Sardiai. Ikigo flashed in front of the gates to Squad 12, eager to get all of his work done so he could proceed with something he actually wanted to do, spend time with his family. That's why he took the more proactive approach whenever he could and just get the reports and paperwork directly instead of waiting in the office for someone to deliver it. Today he was expecting a report on Sacred Gear-related research after sending Azazel's notes to the 12th Division. On top of that, there was another reason why he chose this moment to arrive at Squad 12 as Yushiro rounded the corner. Hey boss man, how's it going? He shouted excitedly while other members of the 2nd Division brought along Kataria, bound and gagged with a dead look in her eyes. You could have told me you weren't going to be in your office before I sent a messenger to your office with the written report. I'll look it over when I get back. Give me the Cliff Notes version. Ikigo ordered as he and the Shihuan walked side by side into the Research Institute of Soul Society. Well, she was being rather tight-lipped about everything so talking didn't work much. He said, sounding disappointed with his lack of success. So we popped out some holy water and used some advanced interrogation methods. We managed to pry this odd energy out of her. He held up a glass canister that held a black snake that emitted a dark energy and pretty much everything regarding the old Satan faction's numbers and secret supporters in the new devil government, and some of the other factions that make up the Kaos Brigade. A group for mages, like the ones that attacked during the Kyo Summit. One comprised of humans that inherited the spirits of heroes. Like the ones that helped us in the Quincy War, Ikigo asked. Achilles, Adelante, Medea, and Karna? Yes, but this group also possessed sacred gears. Leader is some guy called Cow Cow. And then there's the Kulipoth group and something about the true king, before she went into this brain-dead trance. He said, pointing to the unresponsive devil. I told them to be careful with that bucket, but they still ended up dousing her completely. Almost didn't get her to Onohana in time. We'll make do. Take her to Mayuri and see if he can't finish the job. He ordered before turning down a separate corridor toward the newest lab labeled Sacred Gears. Ikigo opened the doors to see that gemstone from Vali's armor that he stole being scanned with Yurahara examining some notes. What do you got? he asked his old mentor. He's certainly a scientist after my heart, Kisuk said, putting the notes down. They're immaculately detailed on the powers, the dangers, and even some possibilities that each one could be capable of if the user gets the right idea. A machine started beeping and printing out a graph and number. One of the other researchers took it and brought it to Kisuk as he immediately read through the results. Interesting. Ikigo, could you get me a piece of the boosted gear's armor? What did you find? Nothing that Azazel didn't already, but I have a theory I want to test. Yurahara said as he went to a board and drew a quick sketch of the two heavenly dragons, Albion and Deedrag, as they appeared in dragon history books. They have a similar power of gaining strength, but through completely contradictory means, Diedreg made himself stronger, but Albion makes everything else weaker. Did they longing things to be that way? Do they apparently hate each other solely because they're opposites or because they're longing conflict? Natural enemies then. Ikigo concluded as the reason why the two were destined to fight. Nah, they were just unrivaled, met up one day, and decided to fight each other since no one else could. That boosting and dividing was the result of trying to circumvent the other's ability. No hate, just a rivalry to push themselves to get stronger. They've been at it ever since. 
It's right here in Azazel's notes. The hybrid had to repress the sudden urge to strangle his old mentor, forgetting that he liked messing with people. But, both he and I are curious about what would happen if they could actually combine like Issei attempted to do before you knocked his lights out. Ikigo raised an eyebrow, wondering if that was really an idea worth pursuing. I mean he could, but brute forcing it would have very likely killed him if not shave off 90% of his devil lifespan. But, I'm willing to bet that I could make it possible and relatively painless by comparison. You think you can easily merge together two completely antithetical powers? Ikigo asked, questioning the logic behind attempting this, even if it could help. It happened before, didn't it? Kisuke countered. How else could you be standing before me? Ikigo paused as he remembered that his soul was comprised of contradictions as Shinigami and Quincy were opposites with how they controlled Raizhi while also possessing hollow powers despite being whole. Good point. I'll see what I can do. Ikigo said as he turned and flashed away back to his office. He still had a mountain of paperwork and a longing to take his wife and daughter to the amusement park in West Rukin. QO Academy, Orc Room. These are our new teachers. Sona said, gesturing to the new additions to the staff. Azazel, who now wore a three-piece suit with the button shirt untucked and the collar open. Tatsuki, who was wearing a red track suit with the jacket unzipped to reveal a white shirt underneath and Yasutora Chad Sato who was wearing a white long-sleeved shirt with a few rose designs on it and black breathe. Azazel will be teaching chemistry and joining Oraheim as the Orc's advisor. Miss Tatsuki Arasawa who will be teaching Jim, be the student council's advisor, and co-advise the new mandatory combat training club with Mr. Yasutora Sato who's teaching music. The devils of the Gremory peerage were surprised but Rias felt her eye twitch. And they're here for the extra security courtesy of Soul Society. Grimjow, Bazard Black, and Jackie Sato. She pointed to the group on the opposite side. Baz B was still wearing a punk-style variant of the Quincy uniform with his red mohawk on proud display, while Jackie was a black woman wearing tight breathe, a gray shirt with a black jacket, shoulder-length black hair, and heavy-looking knee-high boots. Sona, what's with this? she demanded, pointing to Azazel. I know everyone else is here because of Ikigo's orders to up the Gutai presence here, but what's with him? Sona calmly adjusted her glasses. Well, former overseer Rias, the Crimson Devil felt another twitch at being reminded of her demotion. Azazel happens to be our most learned asset when it comes to sacred gears and Lord Sirsech agreed he'd be an invaluable aid to helping all of us strengthen our sacred gears. Or are you going to complain? Rias growled while Sona held a smug smile, enjoying the teasing of her rival. And the mandatory thing, Rias managed to say, being further annoyed that they'll being forcibly commandeering her peerage's time. She admits she needs to get stronger, but there's a difference between doing something by choice and being forced to do it. Miss Tatsuki is a karate and Hakuta MSTR, being a martial arts instructor for new recruits in Karakura Town and Mr. Sato was a punk-turned-world-class boxer. They'll help us cover our regular fighting skills that, frankly, we've been neglecting. Sona answered while her glasses gained a menacing glint. There are no exceptions. I expect everyone of both peerages to attend. But on the bright side, Lord Sirsech informed me that Devilkind can once again expand our operations beyond Kuo. An extra gift from Lord Kurosaki after bugging us and managing to end the three-way war between the biblical factions. I'm getting a sense of favoritism going on here. Reyes complained. Also, Sir Zekas has ordered that your peerage will be living together. Same with mine. Sona informed her, again shocking Reyes who could only sigh. After watching Issei and his fight with Volley, he realized how important close contact among the members of a peerage can be. This was a decision I was against, but Azazel and Ikigo agreed. Something about the bonds of friendship and such strengthening sacred gears. I'll need to renovate Issei's house. The Gremory heiress groaned, not looking forward to fighting with both Asia and now Aquino for Issei's attention. Underscore 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 again. I like DXD. But Issei's Melon's obsession really grates on my nerves. I know he's made them into useful skills. 
but only against women and solely because he's a perv. To fix that, he's getting laid. At some point in this fic, I'm getting him laid. But first, fixing his Rainier trauma. Gabriel's probably going to be the hardest love interest to write since we only have theories on what can really cause angels to fall, but I'm working on the concept of the first commandment. No other gods before me, or as my local priest puts it, anything more important than loving God and one another, like prioritizing selfish longing over helping others. I include fate characters, not fate rules. None of the worst of the fate lore happens in this series. As a result, Rin and Sakaru grew up together as siblings and Ilya wasn't heavily modified to critical levels. Let's just say that their parents were killed by some means and move on. Underscore 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 omic. Family time. It's good to see one's family being happy. Ikugo said with a smile, watching as Rukia and their daughter Hisana put on matching chappy hoodies and freaking out over the soft and cuteness of the design. Agreed, said the person to his right. It's definitely important to get all of one's work done so they can enjoy spending time with their family. Ikugo continued while the other person once more agreed. And it's certainly irritating when someone else knows this but butts in anyway. Indeed. So why the hell are you here by Akuya? Ikigo quietly roared at his brother-in-law. Like you said, spending time with family is important. The Kuchiki head answered calmly, while carrying a ton of plushies and clothing purchases while his sister and niece spent his money on more stuff. Besides, I'm paying for everything. You're Hisana's teacher and they live in the Kuchiki Manor. I want to be involved in my daughter's life by Akuya. The other captain said nothing, not wanting to admit the PP move on his part. That's just how much he loved spoiling his niece. As soon as we put Hasana to bed, I'm going to plow Rukia so strong she'll scream and I won't care if you're in the next room. I wouldn't mind another niece or a nephew. Bayakuya added, making Ikigo sigh in defeat. Later that night, because he promised. H hop, hop, Rukia breathed out, wearing a pink bunny girl outfit with her melons out and her arms and legs wrapped around Ikigo as he furiously moved into her. Ch Chappie loves her treat hop, he held her by her butt as they stood with him bouncing her on his thick pee pee. My little bunny oven is hot and empty, fill me up Tilda, she emanated him out, fully aware her voice was echoing throughout the Kuchiki Manor, but didn't care as Hisana was put into a deep sleep with Kaido. It was a useful practice when the parents needed some time alone and naps weren't lasting long enough. Here, it, come, he roared as he busted inside her, painting her baby room white. Rukia dug her nails into his back as her body seized up from her orgasmic high, slowly loosening her grip as she came down from that high with her tongue hanging out. You're on the pill, right? Ikigo asked, letting his wife gently down on the floor. Yeah, FCK Kato's brigade. She cursed, not minding another kid, but knows how seriously Ikigo takes wartime protocol. He still wants us to have another kid, doesn't he? Rukia asked getting a nod from Ikigo and causing her to sigh. We need to find him a wife. Checking up on Emiya. How much longer are we going to play nurse? Grumbled Rin to Saka, a thin girl with long wavy brown hair tied up in twin tails with black ribbons, wearing a nurse uniform. We came here to be witches and MSTR our powers, but instead of that, they have us taking care of those Emiya kids. Well, we do have to pay off the cost of training said her sister Sakura, a girl with equally long brown hair but was left free and a noticeable bust in her nurse uniform. Besides, this is training in the healing arts. The sooner we patch up his arms, the better that looks in terms of our skills, right? Rin looked to her sister, getting a feeling there was something else to this. Besides, Shiru's a nice guy. She finished with a blush. I guess, Rin admitted, thinking about the redhead and reflecting on their interactions. Maybe we can convince him to lose the shirt this time, she said with a playful grin as Sakura turned scarlet as they reached the door. Well, let's do this. She opened it to find Ilya trying to feed her brother. Come on Shiru, say ah. 
the albino requested as she tried to give him a piece of chicken, much to Shiru's annoyance. I can feed myself Ilya, he protested, though he was straining to move his arms. Ilya saw this and pouted. No way, mister. The doctors told you to take it easy, and that's what you're going to do. Now say ah, the little girl demanded, causing Shiru to submit and open his mouth. Now was that so strong? Ilya asked as she gave him his food. Ah, that's cute, Sakura said with a smile, finding the sibling interaction heartwarming. A little sister being so caring for her big. She's three years older than me, Shiru said, stunning the girls and causing Ilya to pout. I was told there was an accident that stunted her growth before her parents adopted me. Why'd you have to tell them? Ilya complained. I like playing the adorable younger sister. She's older. And he's adopted? The sisters thought, not entirely sure what to make of the situation as the siblings argued. Because why not? Remind me, why did we volunteer for this hun? Jackie asked as the two fullbringers made their way to the Gotai Bureau, Soul Dragon Candy. Couldn't we have just asked for a lengthy vacation instead? Budding global conflict Jackie, Chad said to his wife, I'm not sure we can afford to do that. They entered the candy store to find Kago reading to a young black child with wavy black hair wearing a small pair of boots, black shorts, and gray shirt depicting a black and white demon face on a shield. The kid looked up and smiled, rushing to the pair. Papa, Mommy, Jackie smiled and bent down to catch her five-year-old son, Miles Joaquin Sato in a hug. Seeing their kid was enough to make everything brighter as all of her earlier irritations just washed away. Chaos Karma Soul Society, Squad 1, Main Office Word of our engagement being official is making its way through the Devil's territory. Seraphal said, video calling the Captain Commander with updates on their coming marriage. She took hold of the camera to show off a separate work desk, covered by tall stacks of papers. The number of appeals begging me to reconsider has been staggering. If they were upset that we were dating, they're livid now. Her heavy sigh conveyed how tired she was of it. They keep going on and on about the purity of the devils. Meanwhile, the devil elders that support it just keep telling me to focus on bearing a strong child. They, in their own words, will tolerate a half BLD BSTRD if they're strong. Both the Satan and the Shogun took a moment to drink some tea and calm their stress. I honestly think they're incapable of not being a pain in the butt. Just imagine how PSS they'll be when they learn the full details of the contract you wrote up when you decided to commit to this," Ikigo said, returning a part of his attention to his own desk that was filled with reports and paperwork. Though I do wonder how many would be foolish enough to try and kidnap any kid we have. If that ever happens, he said, mumbling the last part as he remembered the low FRTLTY rates of devils. It'd probably be easier to get a count of how many would leave our children alone. The devil returned. I'm the strongest pure BLD female devil, and you are recognized as a powerful individual as well, though I know they'd rather drink holy water than admit that. She then sighed again and laid her head on her hand. And I also know I shouldn't say this as a devil but, her aura turned murderous, any of them that tries to lay a hand on our children and I will find a way to entomb them in holy water. I'm sure my guys can help you with that. Ikigo added, already thinking on how to inspire the fear necessary to make his still-growing family untouchable. So, do we have a date for the... I want to say wedding but... It'll just be signing a few papers and a party or two, Seraphal answered. No need to do anything lengthy beyond the obligatory celebration party. The former will be before the first round of the Raiding Games tournament for the Young Devils that we'll be holding soon. We've sent invites to the other factions to come and watch since the first meeting will be held in Devil Territory. Ikigo nodded, wondering which other groups would appear to partake in this meeting. Oh, that reminds me. Ikigo, Sir Zechus is planning on getting Azazel to help train Riaz's peerage for the upcoming raiding games. So could you do the same for Sona? Think of it as an engagement present for your cute fiancé, she said with a cutesy smile. Do you really think I'm so easily swayed? The hybrid deadpanned while the devil put her finger to her lips and gave him the puppy eyes. Please, she tried again, making Ikigo sigh. My answer was going to be yes, but know that trying to be cute to manipulate me won't work. I'll see you soon, Seraphal. The Satan said her goodbye and the connection was cut, leaving Ikigo to his paper and his faithful lieutenant. 
Kagatora, I suspect this will take a while, but I should still be able to attend to my paperwork at the very least. I trust you can handle everything until I return? Of course, sir. Nagao answered immediately, already used to doing this when Ikigo was still the captain of Squad 8, just so he could spend some time with his family. Thank you. You're dismissed for the night. Her captain said as she bowed and turned to leave. Don't forget to visit Echigo every now and then. Your village must miss you. He said, causing her to smile as she remembered her old home. Maybe when things calm down after your latest marriages. She returned before walking out the door. Yeah, I'm not one to talk about seeing family am I? Ikigo mumbled as he returned to his work, typing out a message to Kisuk to check the data on the Citri Peerage and to select the best people to help train them. With the Gremory Group. It was a usual morning for the newest Red Dragon Emperor. Issei woke up between Rias and Asia, both naked as the day they were born, but he was too nervous to make any move. Then it was revealed that Akino had also sneaked into his bed and was ready to deepen the understanding of each other before Rias woke up and the two fought over him, Issei just sitting back and choosing to not get involved as they argued before being reminded that his home was now renovated from a modest home to a six-story mansion outfitted with anything and everything any homeowner could want. An overnight change to accommodate his family and the whole Gremory peerage. Once things finally settled down between Rias and Akino, the leader of the peerage called for a meeting in the sanctuary of the remodeled dining room after Issei's parents left. Going back to the underworld? Issei shouted in shock and sadness at the thought of his Rias leaving him behind. But Lord Lucifer said you were still allowed to stay in Kyo. Captain Commander Kurosaki didn't banish you from Japan. Please don't leave me. Rias went over to her pawn and started stroking his face before caressing his head. There there Issei, she said soothingly. I would never abandon you. We'll be together for centuries and millennia. Besides, this is just a yearly trip back home, and I bring the members of my household with me every time. It's going to be a long trip so you'll need to pack for it. The talk soon shifted into what summer plans they had for the Devil Realm, leaving the group unaware as Azazel walked into the club room and sat at the head of the meeting room table. I'll be joining you as well. He announced, surprising the group. Wah? When did you get here? Rias and Kiba asked, making the fallen angel sigh in disappointment. I just walked in through the front door. If you failed to notice me then your training is lacking. He said before mumbling that he's got a lot of work ahead of him as he pulled out Rias's notebook and read her schedule. Pretty straightforward plan here. I and a few others will be meeting with Sir Sechus while you lot stay at the Gremory house. I heard Ikigo will be joining us with the Citri Peerage. That news surprised the devils in attendance while Azazel lazily handed Riaz's notebook back to her. I just found out that Seraphal asked him to train his future little sister. The black-winged angel gained a smirk that was downright fiendish as he looked Riaz dead in the eyes. And I heard there's going to be a raiding game tournament. How does the idea of beating them sound for motivation? The Devil Underworld, Gremory Train This is slow Ikigo thought as he watched the scenery of the underworld go by. The familiar darkness of interdimensional travel giving way to a purple sky of swirling colors ten minutes prior and they were still not at either of their stops. The Citri Peerage met with the Gremory group as they boarded the train in the hidden underground station in Kuo to take the official legal port of entry into the Devil's Domain, a route Ikigo honestly never took before. Every time he came beforehand was usually with Seraphal through one of her portals as a guest of the Satan Leviathan or through a Discora portal he makes and mainly because it always irritated the older pure-blood devils which made both him and Seraphal laugh. Now he was stuck on this luxury train taking a leisurely ride to the Citri territory, and he was bored of it. The last ten minutes couldn't pass fast enough. Come on Kurosaki, it'll be fun Tilda. The fallen angel sitting across from him suggested as Ikigo just tried to focus on meditation. He and Azazel were sharing a car to themselves while Sona and Reyes were in their own and their respective peerages had their cars, currently the governor general of the Grigori was trying to get Ikigo to gamble on the upcoming raiding games. Stake your pride in your teaching skills on their wins. I don't gamble if I don't have to Azazel. The hybrid returned, sending out pesquis pulses and sensing the multitude of spirit signatures throughout the underworld. Two strong ones seemed to be heading toward the train. Please stop trying to convince otherwise and focus. We're completely isolated in here. 
A result of his training under the Hashishin was always checking to see if anyone was watching or listening. TCH, you're no fun. The angel grumbled before leaning back. So, did you bring enough of that surveillance bacteria stuff to share with everybody? This made Ikigo look to Azazel. Because you and Michael might still have some rebellious elements in your own factions. Yeah, they're being quiet about it, but I have no doubts more people in my group are not happy about what we're doing. Ikigo let out a sigh. We'll discuss this at the meeting with Sir Seches and Michael, since I'd rather not repeat myself. Ikigo let out another pesquisa, and those two presences were still heading for them. Understandable. By the way, name dropping you worked like a charm. I got word from Olympus almost immediately that they'd send someone for the initial meeting. I wonder who. Ikigo sent another pesquisa, and the two presences were on an intercept course with the train. Azazel, did you make any arrangements before coming here? The hybrid suddenly asked, surprising the fallen angel. I did ask a dragon king to fight Rias's group, he admitted. I wanted an idea of where everyone was at. He said he'd attack us in the Gremory territory. Why? The two of them were suddenly thrown from their seats as the train made an emergency stop. Seems like there's a change of plans. Ikigo growled as the train's conductor announced that they stopped because Dragon Kings Tannen and Tiamat were closing in. This, this isn't good. The Blaze Meteor Dragon is one thing, but the Chaos Karma Dragon as well, Azazel shouted as the two made their way to the cars with the young devils, everyone congregating in the car of the Gremory Peerage, looking at the two dragons in shock and awe. Both resembled traditional Western dragons the one in the back having purple scales, yellow curved horns and claws, a gray underbelly, and wearing black armor pauldrons and armbands with a gray loincloth, while the frame was unmistakably humanoid, while the one in the front was a bewitching shade of pale blue with a thin lithe frame, and a long serpentine neck ending in a diamond head topped with a crown of horns. Seems like Tiamat's presence is just as much a surprise to Tannen. Azazel said, still in shock at the turn of events as the purple one seemed to be trying to talk to the blue one. Ikigo guessed which one was which from that. Then no one knows why she's here? Ikigo asked as Tiamat's eyes seemed to fixate on their car. The blue dragon's head snapped back to Tannen and released a powerful roar that seemed to effectively cowed him before turning her head back to the train car, more specifically, on Ikigo himself. I knew I recognized something. The Chaos Karma Dragon finally spoke, her voice like gentle ocean waves. It has been a millennium, but I remember the power of that Zanpakuto. Though, the wielder seems to have changed. He blue eyes narrowed on the hybrid. Come out, Soul Reaper. I wish to speak. All eyes turned to Ikigo as he returned the gaze of Tiomat, the Shinigami thinking back to other giant beasts and how none held a candle to the mighty dragon before him. Saying nothing and holding their gaze, Ikigo began to walk to the end of the train car and got off. Manipulating both his and the ambient spiritual energy allowed him to easily walk on the air, letting him get to eye level with the blue dragon. Tiamat, do you remember the man known as Shaijkuni Yamamoto? He called out, feeling Kagatsuchi heating up at his hip as if it too remembered the dragon. A warm gust washed over him as Tiamat sighed in thought. I do recall the name. We've met and fought a long time ago, she said, running a critical eye over the hybrid. I'm curious as to what has happened to him and why his partner seems so different now, but that's not the only thing. She took a deep breath, sniffing Ikigo as the force of the airflow pressed against him. You carry the scent of dragons that seem incomplete and another scent I've not known for a much greater time. Ikigo felt his oaken scar throb as a light shined from his chest. Ah, so that's what that was. The dragon reared her head back, allowing Ikigo to gaze upon her full form. I thought I had sensed that many times over the past few years, but I was usually asleep and dismissed it. Now I know for certain. Her throat began to glow. You've gained my interest, now show me your power. The soul reaper narrowed his eyes to the dragon as his hand gripped one of his blades. Hey, go on ahead without me, Ikigo called out behind him the reactions of the people in the train being mixed between wanting to watch and wanting to run. Let's take this somewhere vacant Tiamat, he suggested before unleashing his Riyatsu, surprising the two dragons, because I have a feeling our fight would only leave ruin. The pale dragon purred in excitement. Follow me, little one, she said before flying off, Ikigo following closely behind. 
back on the train. Come on, Issei shouted, his sacred gear already out. We have to go back, he struggled in vain as he was being held down by Kiba, Saji, and Kaneko. How can we just leave him back there? Issei, just shut up and stay down, Diedreg's voice rang out from the red gauntlet. The last thing you want to do is attract Tiamat's attention. Leave that to the Soul Reaper and avoid her at all costs. She must really be bad news if you want to avoid her. The pawn said as he relented, not like he could really do anything anyway. The matter was out of his hands. I borrowed something she liked and it was stolen and scattered. He admitted, surprising everyone. She's never forgiven me and there's no way you can pay off that debt right now. If she finds you, you're dead. Issei once again cursed his weakness and looked back to where Ikigo and Tiamat flew off. Unknown region. It took them a while, flying beyond the territory of any devil, to find a suitable place to call their battlefield. The landscape was a barren valley, no plants or animals to be seen or sensed for miles. Either they fled from Tiamat or simply never existed, the fact remained that the land was empty. Perfect for two forces of incredible power to clash. Both the Shinigami and the dragon stood on the ground, facing each other. Before we fight, do you mind telling me why you want this? Ikigo asked, his hand resting on his sealed Zenjetsu Zanpakuto. This was to be a straightforward bout so he intended to treat it as such, deciding to draw the others only if necessary. Before becoming a dragon, I was once a primordial goddess. She answered, her head drifting back down to better look at him while a claw came to his chest. I remember the original state of the world, when the one you call the Soul King first decided to protect all of us. I remember his mutilation at the hands of your predecessors and his later imprisonment. With surprisingly delicate movements and control, Tiamat's claw gently pulled open Ikigo's Shihakusho to reveal his oaken scar. But, seeing that glow from earlier, I knew that he was freed and named you as his favored among the souls of mortals. I wish to see that person in action she said as she drew her claw back. Show me your power, why he favors you so, then take me to see my revived brother. Ikigo closed his eyes. Very well, Zanjetsu. Instantly he drew and slashed. Getsuga Tenshu, he yelled, as a crescent of energy shot out from a long kyber blade with a hollowed center. The sudden aggression surprised the dragon as she quickly swung her claws to smash through the attack, the energy exploding against her talons before she roared at Ikigo or rather where he was standing. Getsuga Jujisho, Ikigo called out again as he manifested a smaller trench blade in his other hand and swung the two in a cross strike, a massive X of rise he slamming into Tiamat's unprotected chest and point-blank range. She shot back a bit, gripping onto the ground and tearing deep gouges in an effort to steady herself from the sudden and vicious attack. You certainly waste no time. She hummed as she swung her wings out and create a devastating gale, one that threw up the many debris and rubble made as he claws tore through the ground. Ikigo responded by stomping into the ground and tossing up Zenjetsu, the wind immediately blowing them away, before throwing a barrage of ballast with each one destroying a rock. Tiamat's throat then glowed bright before the dragon unleashed a torrent of white flames at the hybrid. Ikigo allowed the fire to close in and nearly engulf him before flashing away floating just behind Tiamat as he held out his hands with the dual Zampakuto shooting back to his hands. The dragon saw them coming and let her scales deflect them, grunting slightly as the strike still hammered into her shoulders with a relative nick into her natural armor. Getsuga, Ikigo readied another strike as Tiamat also turned with a deceptive speed as the flap of her wing disoriented him, causing him to be open to the dragon's backhand strike. He slammed into one of the rock walls as Tiamat readied another fiery blast, intent on testing the limits of his endurance. Ikigo quickly irked a kaido barrier and watched the flames wash over him, the rocky environment quickly glowing red from the intense heat, as he thought of his next move. Eventually, Tiamat's flames ended with the area around Ikigo still glowing. A strong barrier. The dragon complimented as the hybrid released the kaido. And now you brave the heat. I can't imagine this would be comfortable for you. A. Misty R. Yamamoto's was hotter. He answered before turning around and flared with Ryoku as he temporarily activated his Shunko, destroying his Shihakusho while his Hayori flew off, before he threw both of his fists into the mountainside. Sakatsu, he called out as the mountain shattered into rubble, slightly impressing the dragon as she watched. 
Hado hash 57, Dechai Tenyo. He turned and moved his hand at Tiamat with every last rock and stone now flying at her. She attempted to swat them away, but the sheer force and volume quickly buried. Ikigo dispelled the spell as his clothes started to restore themselves. Maybe we should make this kind of fabric standard for the Gotai, he thought, thanking that he had self-repairing clothes. But then, what would Senjimano do? He was brought out of his thoughts as he noticed the winds and air pressure changing. What the, he managed to say as Tiamat burst from her burial mound with an ear-splitting roar, a massive torrent of water coming from around her, and the two of them now caught in a powerful hurricane. Truly a force of nature Ikigo thought as he watched the dragon took flight as the storm grew ever stronger, rocks of varying sizes flying about on the wind fast enough to tear anyone too weak to shreds. The hybrid then took note of some new presences at the edge of his passive senses and released a pesquisa to confirm that some unwanted attention was heading their way. We should end this now. I'd rather not expose more than I have to. He quickly decided as he released three of his suppression seals with fiery black Ryarioku rising from his body. You're a hotto. He raised his right hand, a massive black eastern dragon head forming with puffed up cheeks. Sonodo, Tepisatsu. Ikigo swung his arm down and the manifested dragon head unleashed its own gale, one that blew away Tiamat's storm. The dragon king was forced back to the earth with Ikigo calmly raising the kyber blade of Zanjetsu slowly cutting into his other arm and coating the edge in his BLD, as spiritual energy gathered on the sword. Gran Rei Getsuga Tensho. He swung down as the blade of energy shot toward Tiamat, slamming into the dragon and engulfing her in a large explosion. Ikigo stood by as the smoke cleared, revealing Tiamat covered light burns and many of her scales were peeled away, glaring at the hybrid. You're holding back, she accused as Ikigo flashed in front of her. And by quite a lot, how much do you intend to insult me? You asked to see my power and I showed you. The hybrid responded. This was not a duel to the death, nor did you seem intent to kill me. Not that I'd want to kill such a divine creature. Besides, I'd rather not reveal more of what I can do than necessary. She released an agitated growl but bowed her head. I see now why my brother favors you. She said while Ikigo reverted Zenjetsu back to its sealed form and returned the bow and I thank you for this fight. The commander said, then stood up and moved his Zampakuto to the side, the blade disappearing as it sank into the space before he turned it like a key. Unlock, he ordered, the space distorting as a pair of sliding doors manifested before opening. Take this gate and you'll reach the Soul Society. Ikigo told her as a few black butterflies came fluttering about the dragon. I'll let them know you're coming, but I still have some things I need to take care of her in the underworld. The hybrid flashed away, reappearing high above the field with his phone out and already ringing. This is Aiken. Go ahead, Captain Commander. The Squad 12 member answered. I've met and fought the Dragon King Tiamat. Now I'm sending her to Soul Society because the Soul King requests her presence. Ikigo watched as the dragon shrank and took a new form before walking through the gates. She took a human form, but you should still be able to sense her dragon power. Understood, sir. Any particular orders regarding her? Ikigo thought for a moment. Tell her to enjoy the hot springs, he said before hanging up. Now, let's remove everything. He raised his right arm, now black with fiery red lines cracking along his limb. Hado hash 96, Ido Kaso. For miles around, anyone could look and see a fiery red explosion that rocked the devil's home. The spot where Ikigo and Tiamat fought was now replaced with a charred black crater and no trace of any energy could be sensed, all of it being absorbed into the hybrid with Sclavere. The only trace of his presence and fight was that single massive crater. Underscore 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 Yeah, sorry for the wait everyone. I've had a rather unlucky February and I've been trying to work through it. The poll for Zenovia's Zampakuto is over Axe Winds, by a huge lead, and I've started a new poll concerning Tiamat's human form. Go to my profile page and vote for which you want to see, that'll be the form Ikigo eventually sleeps with. Because DXD. 
Anyway, instead of all makes I've come up with this new segment called DX Diaries, which look into various characters that I couldn't cover during epilogue episodes. Hope you enjoyed this chapter, and let's pray the next one can come sooner. Underscore 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 DX Diaries. Nagal Kagatora. Many of the details of my time among the living are forgotten but I still remembered the clang of steel and the smell of fire. I remembered living during the Warring States era and how the ruling lords changed as often as coins in a peddler's hand. My life ended in a bandit attack and I fought to my final breath, determined to die as a courageous samurai warrior. Eventually I found myself in the care of the Soul Society. Becoming a Soul Reaper was an easy decision, I had the power and skill, but I also saw it as a chance to help all the lost and bound souls that were made during that time. A noble longing I had intended to follow through on and had proven to have a promising future, quickly rising up the ranks of the 6th Division. But the longer I stayed in it, the more I saw how the Rukin was basically ignored beyond the occasional hollow. Any arguments I made to change that seemed to fall on deaf ears until I had had enough. It was on total impulse, but during a mission to exterminate a few hollows in the lower Rukin, I decided to fake my death, an effort to ensure I wasn't arrested for desertion and treason. I waited for days and weeks in hiding to make sure that they wouldn't try to find me and that I was now safe. Once I was confident in my new freedom, I started gathering those trapped in the slums of the lowest districts of the Rukin with the idea of finding a new home beyond the reach of the Serate. It took no small effort, but after a few years we finally built ourselves a new self-sustaining village. We called it Echigo and I took up the name of Nagao Kagatora, honoring the lord of my original home in the land of the living. My original name was long discarded and forgotten as I took up my new purpose as protector of my new home. For centuries we were left alone and relatively safe under my protection with my Zampakuto Hachihana ready to strike down any that threatened our small village. But that would not last as a group of soul reapers came to our home. They claimed to not be hostile, but I would not listen. We put too much work into building Echigo to let the Soul Reapers take it from us. I fought and captured them, imprisoning them in the village to demand answers. Why now? What was the Serate planning? They told me what I could only believe as a lie, that the Gotai and Soul Society was changing and expanding. More Gotai agents came and again I would best them, though eventually during one fight a single Shinigami fled and would alert the greater Gotai. It didn't matter, I would fight anyone to protect Echigo. Eventually a captain came, wearing the Hayori of Squad 8 and identifying himself as the future captain commander, Ikigo Kurosaki. He asked if I was the one that kept besting the others and offered me a position as his lieutenant. I scoffed and told him he would have to beat me first, to which he only smiled and accepted. I fought fiercely, even being driven to use my Bankai to overwhelm him with eight copies of equal skill and power, but he didn't respond in kind. He wielded four different Zampakuto and only used three Shikai, and I couldn't beat him. After my Ryoku was spent, I pleaded with him to take my head but spare my home. His response? He came here to find a worthy right hand, nothing more. And so, I became the lieutenant of Squad 8 and returned to the Serate after a long three centuries. I saw firsthand the change that I refused to believe in, the Rukan police force of Squad 14 being the most welcome sight for me. The Shinigami were showing more care to their charges, the slums were slowly fading away into clean streets where children could happily run through, a thriving economy that brought smiles to the people. It was jarring to see and I was overjoyed, but a part of me wanted to continue refusing to believe it. I stood by my new captain's side, ready to betray him if he proved this was all a lie on some level, but he was always genuine. I was made to bear witness that the corrupt Serate and Gotai I had abandoned so long ago was now living up to its role as guardians of the living and dead souls as they passed through the cycle of rebirth. I swore to follow my captain, even before he was named Shogun by Lady Amaterasu. Ikigo Kurosaki was the lord I waited my whole life for, both of them. Setting a new stage. Devil Underworld, Citri Territory. Finally here. He said as he finished his flash movement, standing on a rise-he platform above the main residence of the Citri clan. 
The Citri territory was one of the few that he genuinely liked among the Devil's home, putting much effort into looking like a verdant paradise due to the Citri's many nature preserves. Most of his more enjoyable dates with Seraphal consisted of walks and picnics in one of the many parks and forests of the Citri. The rest was binge-watching anime whenever they could get away from the formal parties the rest of the nobility put on. Let's see. Seraphal, Sona's peerage, the lord and lady, and their staff. Ikigo whispered after sending out a pesquisa pulse, then sent out another, but enhanced to identify surveillance spells and bugs. Nothing here to spy on us. Good to know. He whispered before flashing again, now standing atop a gate at the entrance of the main residence, where the Citri family seemed to be teasing their heiress. Saying, that is a fellow really proved himself fighting riser said Seraphal, dressed business casual with a dark green button-up shirt and a knee-length skirt. Who's to say you wouldn't fall for your pawn the same way, she teased, earning an annoyed blush from her sister while Saji was drifting to cloud nine, grinning like an idiot. I would certainly appreciate it if he did gain your favor as a suitor, said a man in a blue suit with neat black hair and square glasses standing next to a lovely woman with long black hair wearing an aqua blue dress. The current heads of the family, Lord Citri. Part of your duties as the future head of the family is the continuation of the bloodline. You won the right to decide your own husband Sona, but keep this in mind. Seraphal, your older sister, is getting married soon. He put a heavy emphasis on the Satan, hoping that it was clear they didn't have much hope of their eldest ever settling down. Not only that, but is forming a union that will be a great asset to both our family and devil society if even half the things I heard from that Captain Yurahata is true. Do me a favor and try to be content with a tenth Lord Citri. Ikugo said as he revealed his presence and surprising Saji since the rest of the Citri household were already used to the Soul Reaper. Until the old Satan faction is removed, I intend to be very miserly with what the Gotai can offer the devils. The captain commander said as he floated down to the ground. Unfortunate, but fair. The devil patriarch admitted. And Ikigo, I do hope you'll start calling me father in the near future. We'll see, but for now, Ikigo said before wrapping an arm around Seraphal's waist and pulling her close to him. I need to plan out how to keep a promise to my lovely fiancé. If you don't mind, I'll need a space to focus on training Sona's peerage. A radius of a few dozen miles minimum should suffice. Seraphal blushed and wrapped her arms around his waist, Saji looking on in longing as he imagined him and Sona in that same position. Easy to do, I'll have my people scout out a good spot, Lord Citri said. Ikigo thought that anything else could wait until after he has his meeting with the other factions. He and Seraphal were about to flash away when, one more thing, I've read the contract Seraphal wrote up, the Citri head said, causing the two to pause. Only the heads of the family and the betrothed couple knew all the details of the contract, leaving Sona and her peerage in the dark. Seraphal tightened her hold slightly, concerned about the direction this might go. Please understand that any child you two make will be part of the Citri pillar. I also offer the protection that can provide. What he means is, please let me see my grandchildren so I can spoil them rotten. Lady Citri said with a smile, causing her husband to glow red with embarrassment while he adjusted his glasses in an effort to cover his face. This caused the two to sigh, the tension fading away as the matter was less serious than the expected. Don't hold your breath you two, Ikigo dryly said. I know the devil's abysmal BRTH rate and I don't make it a habit to sire children when conflict is on the horizon. Which just means we'll have to beat the Kalos Brigade as soon as possible, Seraphal added with a smile. But till then, I'm looking forward to enjoying ourselves. She finished, grabbing a handful of Ikigo's butt. The hybrid didn't react as the pair disappeared with his godspeed. Devil Capital, Lilith. Main HQ. It took a single instant for the pair to appear high above the capital city of Devil Territory and another to make their way to the building where the four Satans dictated the course of their species. A large three-story building four extensions at the corners to serve as the wings for their other duties while the central building was the management center of the realm. One quick pesquisa told Ikigo that the other Satans and Michael were already there. Azazel was the only one not in attendance. I only just got word from Grafia that they arrived at home and that Azazel is heading here now. Sir Seches told them after they went inside to get the current news. 
The meeting room was gigantic and had a large rectangular table that was usually used for the meetings with the various other leaders of the devils. But today's meeting was in the lounge section with a large glass coffee table with a set of recliners and sofas. We probably should have told him how fast you can be. Ikigo merely sighed, walked to a window, opened it, and flashed away. Ten seconds later, he was back with the fallen angel slung over his shoulder. There, let's get this meeting started. The shogun said before tossing Azazel onto one of the sofas. Ugh, why the rough treatment? The leader of the fallen groaned out as he sat himself upright while everyone else took a seat. Because I have more work to do back home because of a certain dragon king. I heard about that. Is Tiamat now moving to Soul Society permanently? Sir Zetches asked as all eyes went to the hybrid. Not entirely sure, but I'm going to find out eventually. Ikigo reached into his shiakusho and pulled out a sealed wooden case, placed it on the table, and unfolded the lid. Inside were clear plastic discs with spots of white fluff covering a red gel, a series of tube vials with the same white fluff, and a small SD card with a skull on it. Here you are. Surveillance bacteria cultures and plug that card into your phone to download the program to link to them. Ajika was the first to reach into the case, pulling out the data card. No offense to the rest of you, but only Ajika will be using that card. When I return, I'll have a version for Michael and Azazel since this batch is mainly for devils. Understood? The smartest devil relented before pulling out a stack of papers. Here's a list of names affiliated with the Great King faction of the Devils and their usual routes. Ikigo took the list and looked over the pages of names. This could take a while and I'm going to need some good cover, the Shogun told them. A particularly interesting and intense rating game would be the best choice. A few names come to mind, Sir Sesh said. My sister, Sona, and my cousin Seriorg being the most promising teams. The question is what kind of match should they have? Something that can take a while, but still exciting enough to hold the focus of the crowd. Falbium said, already trying to think of a proper match to use for Ikigo's cover. Pretty soon the Satans and Azazel started brainstorming ideas for the match, something Ikigo felt confident he could leave in their care. I think I'll return to Soul Society now. He said as he stood up and began walking away, taking the case of bacteria cultures with him. When do you need me to return? There will be a gathering of the various young heirs of Devil Society in about three days, Seraphal said, looking to Ajika for confirmation and getting a nod in return. Yeah, three days in the old capital of Lucifod. Mostly for the elders and the Satans, but we can definitely get you to join in. Especially since you'll be my husband Tilda. She added with a wink that generated a pink heart. Everyone just looked at her before Ikigo turned, opened a Garganta portal, and walked right through. Soul Society. I'm back, what's there to do? Ikigo asked as he walked through the tier in space and returned to his office, finding Nagao at his desk sorting through reports and other paperwork. Need your signature on a few budgetary reports, proposed training missions into the living world, and to deal with the dragon Tiamat, who is currently at the hot springs at Squad 4. She quickly reported, setting the stacks apart for him to go through later. She seems content with enjoying her bath at the moment, though she is waiting for you, sir. Thank you, Kagatora, he said, moving to his desk and settling in to get through some of his paperwork. I'll try to put a dent in this before going to talk with her. Ikigo also reached out to his computer and began typing away a message to Squad 12, requesting an angel variant of the surveillance bacteria. Squad 4 Hot Springs Excuse me, Lady Tiamat, a random female voice called out to the dragon's human form as she laid in the water. She was a breathtaking and ethereal beauty with icy blue hair that reached to her legs, gaining a darker shade the further it went, and vibrant piercing rose-pink eyes. The hot springs were an open-air bath in a stone pool with a high bamboo fence, the water steaming from the heat and carrying the heavy scent of herbs meant to relax and rejuvenate. Commander Kurosaki has returned to Soul Society and is trying to catch up to his work. Thank you for telling me. I can wait. She responded while allowing herself to sink into the water, in delight as it consumed her in a warming embrace. Her mind drifted back to the past few minutes she came to Soul Society. How everyone freaked out over her being naked in public, forced a yukata onto her for public decency, and then showed her all the various baths they offered and insisted she enjoy herself. 
dressed for all of five minutes before shedding that robe and soaking in the bath. It was pointless in her opinion, but the bath was making up for it. First was the cleaning process where a few servants, she assumed anyway, came with her to help her clean. She could easily use magic to clean away any dirt and grime that got on her, but there was something soothing about having attendants getting those strong to reach places and helping with her long hair. It reminded her of a time long since past when her family was more whole, before her children struck her and her lover down to claim dominion of their realm. Now thinking about the past, her mind sank further into the ocean of her memories, the vast chaos of the old world, the frail new souls before they became gods and dragons, the primordial hollows that devoured everything in their wake. And then you became the first protector, she thought, reaching up from the water to the skies above where the royal realm resides. The rest of us gods and dragons followed your example, but by the time our siblings gained enough strength to join you in that mission, you had already allowed yourself to be condemned to that hellish fate. Her arm fell limp, making a light splash in the water, as she continued to wonder, why did you let it happen? Why didn't you fight back and become our sole king? Guess I'll find out soon enough, she decided as she spied Ikigo standing above her with his hand stretched out to her. She took it and was gently pulled up from the water finding the hybrid standing head and shoulders above her as he was floating on top of the spring's surface. How was the bath? he asked her as she got to her feet. You certainly had long enough to form an opinion. Tiamat took a breath, turning the moisture clinging to her body to steam as she released it. It was lovely. She admitted as she moved to get out. I'm told there are many more, but they can wait till later. Were you waiting long? I actually finished two minutes ago, but you've been soaking for two hours, he said, not surprising the dragon in the slightest. I see, she said, picking up a pale blue yukata decorated with pink water lilies. Being so close to my brother brought back some old memories. She slipped the robe on, before turning back to the hybrid. I'm ready, bring me to him. The two held their gaze for a moment before Ikigo looked up to the royal realm and snapped his fingers. Almost instantly the presence of the soul king that seemed muffled and distant became as clear as day for Tiamat, bringing a calm and nostalgic smile to the dragon's face. Now, hang on, Ikigo said as he walked over to Tiamat and picked her up in a princess carry, flashing away before she could say anything. Soul Society, Royal Palace It was a tranquil scene, a cylindrical temple surrounded by thick stone walls floating high above a vast empty disc platform in the midst of the endless sky. Within that temple was a single room occupied by a pale man with slicked back black hair dressed in a simple robe, sitting on a throne of crystal, resting as he waited for something to happen. By his side was a white broadsword with black spots, a katana, and a large calligraphy brush, three extremely powerful weapons reserved only for his bodyguard and himself, akin to Longinus' sacred gears in those hands. They, however, paled in comparison to the god himself, a being whose abilities were named as Almighty. His eyes slowly opened, revealing four pupils and irises in each eye, as Ikigo and Tiamat appeared before him. Lady Tiamat, your highness. Ikigo introduced as Tiamat approached the Soul King and knelt in respect. It has been a long time since I saw you alive, my dear brother. She said with a smile, looking up to her kin who returned it. It has indeed, but I see you've lost much of your power since then. The Soul King responded, speaking in something that felt ancient that his guard couldn't comprehend, as if it was from before the concept of words and language. Tiamat paused for a moment, as if trying to remember it herself, before responding in kind. Yes, I'm sorry to admit, but I had to lose much of my power to hide myself away, she explained to her brother. After your imprisonment and the chaos settling, we tried to live in peace, but each pantheon was rife with infighting and rebellions. My own children betrayed and killed me. And thus all the primordial gods went into slumber or hiding, crippling their powers after their revivals in order to hide. The soul king finished, just as I had foreseen. Tiamat's head snapped up in surprise. You saw this? She asked in shock. Most of us assumed there was a reason on why you allowed that, but you saw it coming. Why not stop it? Why not take your place as our king back then? We grew stronger, we could have helped you fight the hollows, or seal. She was shouting before a terrifying pressure silenced her. This was the best option. The Soul King said with absolute authority before the pressure faded. 
I see everything, all things that currently are and everything that could be. So, Tiamat, understand that I did not accept my prison lightly. The dragon bowed her head in SBMSN, memories of him destroying hordes of Minos with ease flooding her mind while her brother explained his decision all those millennia ago. Of all the paths I saw, only the ones where I was sealed showed me the greatest number of our kin surviving. The odds of my hellish torment were as close to a guarantee as you could get, but I was willing to make that sacrifice because I wanted to protect you. The other options were, eternally fighting the hollows as I step back. I continue to fight alone since I was the one that could, or all of creation ending up destroyed due to the disruption of the balance. Were we truly so weak in your eyes, brother? That you would rather suffer than let us join you in battle? She asked, feeling betrayed and saddened. I'm no King Tiamat, not in the sense of a leader. I am a protector, always have been and always will be. The Soul King answered, returning to a gentle tone. My only concern has been the well-being of our kin and this new world made from my sacrifice. Tiamat rose to her feet, turning her gaze on the Soul King. That said, considering how the other gods have been trying to run the world, maybe I should take over. This caught Goddess's attention. What do you mean, brother? She asked earning a glare from the Soul King. Don't play ignorance, Tiamat. Pretty much each pantheon has a list of ways they've screwed things up, he said, holding up a finger. All the infighting within each group and all the damages they've caused. Hell was sealed and the hollows concentrated to a single region. You finally had peace and nearly all of you turned your fangs on each other for dominion of your new homes. Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Mesoamerica, Norse, too much internal conflict when you should have come together to make what happened to me unnecessary. And that's not even going into how too many prove themselves to be embarrassments to the praise and worship they've been given. Ishtar, for starters, stormed the underworld to claim all three realms and unleashed Gugulana just because Gilgamesh rejected her. Greedy, arrogant, and vain. Odin, in his paranoia and delusions to prevent their apocalypse only guaranteed it would happen by making enemies of those foretold to kill him. I could spend all day listing the faults of the Olympians with Zeus needing one for himself alone. I could go on, but you get the idea by now I hope. He listed off, making Tiamat flinch a little each time. Most of them have improved and mellowed out, but I see that arrogance still seethes within them. Particularly that Brad Indra, seeking to claim all the world and the heavens under his authority he'll receive a reminder of where he stands eventually. Yahweh tried, but his favoritism to humanity and neglect to consider envy and jealousy caused the fallen and the devils to come from his angels and formed a three-way civil war that turned him into a tyrant. The next one will be better, I'll see to it. He lowered his hand and leaned forward, keeping his gaze on the dragon. But the past is the past, and we should look to the future, using the experience of the past to make better decisions. Which leads to why you're even here, Tiamat. What are your goals from here on? She thought for a moment before meeting her brother's gaze. The status quo of the world is changing. That much is apparent even to those of us that secluded ourselves. Eventually, there will be no true bystanders, only sides, and I'd rather be on the one with the greatest chance of success. I still remember that there were others that were around your level, but none have your foresight. As such, my powers will be yours to command. I have but a simple request in exchange. Over the millennia I've come to identify more with the dragons than with the other gods. I wish to ensure that they remain free and safe. Understandable. The Soul King said, nodding as he recalled the fates of many dragons. They are sources of incredible power and can be made into powerful weapons while their energy can mutate both living and inanimate objects. An entire branch of Soul Society is dedicated to managing that energy and those affected by it. Your assistance will be welcomed, and they will aid you in kind. But first, before anyone could react, Tiamat was covered head to toe in black ink with the Soul King holding that massive calligraphy brush from his side. Let's restore a bit of your godhood. Shinuchi, Shirafud Ikamanji. The god said as the brush head shined white. In a single swipe he wrote on Tiamat a phrase in a long forgotten language. Mother of dragons, goddess Tiamat. How are you feeling now, sister? Ra! she roared out, the inks sinking into her skin as she pulsated with power. Once she ended, she bore a calm smile, like my old self again. The two smiled to each other before the Soul King looked to his guard. Thank you for bringing my sister to me, Ikigo. Now I ask you to set her up a home in the Soul Society, one where she can nurture and watch over the dragons. 
That is her price for aiding you. The hybrid nodded. Understood. It's time I went back home anyway. It's getting late. Ikigo said as he started leaving, dreading the next mountain of paperwork ahead of him because of this. Kyo, before dusk. The city was peaceful, enjoying a sense of quiet while the devils that ran the area were in the devil's underworld and before the god eye agents present did their work. Nothing really unusual was happening anywhere, but only to the unobservant. Some might hear a swish of the wind or a burst of static. Some might see something that was only there for an instant before it disappeared again. But there was one thing that was consistent throughout the day no matter who you asked. The laughter of children. What would later become a ghost story throughout QO about the wandering spirits of children was actually just kids playing a simple game of tag, played at high speeds. Eleven blurs sped around the rooftops and streets of Kyo, laughing as they chased one another until one stopped on a tower and revealed Ikino's Ishida, who was looking to the setting sun. Hey, it's getting late. The young Quincy announced as the other ten stopped, revealing Ikigo's other children, young Yakaru, and a new girl in a gothic Lolita dress with hair down to her hips. Ikino's is right, Kin said, pulling out a pocket watch to verify the time. Truthfully, we should have stopped twenty minutes ago. She was silently berating herself because she was more responsible than this, but she was just having too much fun with her siblings and friends. Though knowing their mothers the real issue would be that they didn't tell anyone and not that they were out late. Or in another city. Then let's hurry home guys. Kazui said before turning to his Arankar brother and Shihuan twins. Abaru, Yuyuichi, Kin, you guys think you can sneak Kunu back into her room at the Kyoto castle? He asked as Abaru smirked before opening a garganta, the dark-skinned pair already grabbing their yaokai sister and jumping through. Everyone else, let's hurry before our moms find out. See you later off eyes, today was a lot of fun. And the offer to come play in Karakura town is open. He told the gothic Lolita girl before flashing away. Bye. The dragon god said, lazily waving despite the other children being long gone. She let herself fall backwards, looking up to the sky as she reflected on the day. They met by chance. The green-haired twins had her change her open blouse to something more tasteful as they did a little makeover before she could reveal her shape-shifting powers. Then they just chased after each other for hours. The entire experience was refreshing, she thought. Today was fun, she said, somewhat wishing that time would pass by quicker so they could play again. Underscore 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 Yeah, sorry this took forever. Spring and summer are usually my busiest Earl time. As you can see, Fake Tiamat is the winner of which model I'll be using. It was close though. I've been informed that some have been hoping for Seraphal to do crazier things, but hopefully this all make and diary entry will soothe things out a bit. Underscore 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 omake. Sarah Falls Daydream. Heavy breathing and barely muffled Eminem filled the air tracing back to a bed occupied by Gabriel and Seraphal. Both were dressed in Sailor Moon cosplay, Gabriel as Moon herself with her hair tied in round-tailed buns while Seraphal dressed like Mars, though the Satan had an upside-down black crescent mark on her tiara instead of a red jewel. Dressed was generous as well since Gabriel's chest were exposed and at Seraphal's mercy as she fondled them from behind. The devil also embrace and lick a trail from the angel's nape up to her ear with Gabriel trying and failing to hold back her pleasure. Soon one of Seraphal's hands left the seraph's chest and trailed down, pulling aside the crotch of the leotard and getting her hands soaked in holy water. Well, Prince Demand, Seraphal said to Ikigo, whose hair was silver now with a similar crescent mark on his forehead, she's ready for your love, Tilda. The hybrid smiled hungrily and stepped forward dream sequence end, setting, the Kyoto baths in CH8. And then he takes Gabriel passionately as I watch and pleasure myself before he takes me too. 
Seraphal told Ikigo's HRM during their bath, some listening in interest, Gabriel covering her face to hide her blush, and Haribol just letting the devil play with her melons. I think I was expecting something more, Tatsuki said, gaining a few looks. That seemed pretty tame by our standards. Seraphal raised an eyebrow. Yeah, Orihaim agreed. Once I had a duplicate of my body around and Tatsuki got in it, and we had a three-way with Ikigo. Kind of want to do it again. Duplicate body? Three-way with it? How did that work? Seraphal asked, prompting a small explanation on Gigi. As they told the devil what little they knew on the subject, her eyes grew wide, and she made a personal promise to get access to it for one reason. One ultimate and very important reason. It was like the ultimate level of cosplay. Why dress up as the character when you can wear an actual body? With that in mind, her thoughts were flooded with the possibilities she wanted to make reality. DX Diaries Sarah Falsitri I hated the day I met him. It was an embarrassment to our kind to have this happen, to be reminded that some of the devils were still willing to commit to such acts of atrocities. Unlike myself and my fellow Satans, they continued to ignore the reality of something eventually reacting and biting back harder than they could take. We lost too many devils because of the foolish arrogance of our nobility and were having a strong time replenishing our numbers already. Being virtually kicked out of an entire country did us no favors and this wasn't a battle that could be solved with magic or bloodshed, only politics. We took some time to revise some laws and regulations in an effort to make it more difficult to attempt the things that led to the Nekashu incident before even attempting to try and speak with the Gotai on political terms. Not that they made it any easier with any agents we've met keeping their distance and being stone-faced. It was well after a year of this that Sir Sech managed to find Ikigo Kurosaki in the Celtic lands. For him it was a chance to settle some business outside of devil interests and politics, and to warn him about our less than amicable members and their intentions. That became another headache we've had to deal with, the brilliant ideas that were devised on how to handle the one they blamed for humiliating our race. Sir Seches took it upon himself and his peerage to prevent any would-be assassin, or similar plans regarding such, from leaving the underworld to target him. I myself had the fortune of hearing a million other ideas of bribing Kurosaki with anything he might longing. Wealth, women, anything that could have been offered. But they were constantly dismissed. Ajika could tell at a glance that we had nothing he would have wanted that badly, something other, more experienced devils had a strong time believing. On top of that, I'm still getting demands to have children and marriage proposals with pure BLD. I won't deny taking on a few lovers, or just FCK friends, in my life, and I do understand the longing to see our species propagate, but I hate having it forced on me. I'm one of the main leaders of our race, and they insist on pressuring me like my authority doesn't exist. Half the reason I obsess over stuff like magical girls and anime is mainly to PSS them off for catharsis and it only got better for me after we got banished from Japan. They were annoyed by my otaku habits before, but now they were livid with it. Honestly, the only thing that would make them more angry was if I personally courted Ikigo, which is what I ended up doing. Convincing him was the easy part. I was completely transparent about my aims of eventually using this relationship to further the devils, but mostly I wanted to PSS off the elders. That was something he could understand, something about stuffy nobles back in the Soul Society, and we spent quite some time figuring out a game plan on this matter. During that time he took me back to Japan where I met his wives and explained the plan to them. They agreed to share him to an extent, but Sek was off the table. A shame, it would have gone a long way in our scheme, but it wasn't a privilege I was allowed to have. Though Oraheim did imply I might one day get that, but was vague about the conditions. I wouldn't think much about it. I had a party to attend and a prank to enact. The looks on their faces was an image I would cherish for the rest of my long life. I legit thought they were about to have aneurysms from how much they were straining to not rage and curse. It was a dignified gathering of the higher rank of our society and the impotent lectures I got was worth it to see them seethe so much but unable to do really act on it. Well, aside from trying to poison and curse him, but nothing seemed to affect him. I know I warned him this might happen, but it was still concerning to see him chug down enough poison to drop a dragon. Anyways, it was that same day I introduced him more formally to my family. Mom took a shine to him almost instantly because of course she would. She was one of the most loving and kind devils alive. Dad kept himself composed and polite. 
He actually knew the real plan, but he still held on to the hope that I might actually find a permanent husband. My darling little Sona, she was shy and tried to hide from him. Not unusual for children around that age and over the years she came to consider him her true brother, long before I even considered a proper engagement. She even referred to him as such when talking with some other nobles. I've wondered what was the deciding factor, but my family accepted him and over the years my own faith in him became solid. When Sona told me about Kakabil's attack, I wasn't concerned in the slightest. When I realized that, I also knew I fell in love with Ikigo Kurosaki. Sona's footnote. Over the years, I noticed Ikigo's presence managed to take my super childish and obsessive older sister and make her calm. Calmer. For that, I love him as my brother. Plus, keeps the CISCON stuff to a minimum. Meetings and parties. Citri territory. True to Lord Citri's word, a spot was picked out and a building was supplied. A large two-story building with a massive indoor pool, spa options, cafeteria, targeting ranges, combat arenas, and rooms with state-of-the-art exercise equipment for men and women, as the bottom level with the top level having dorms for the teachers and peerage members with a game room filled with strategy-focused games. No expense spared with it and no intention of actually using it beyond warming up and cooling down. Dad spent a fortune on that building, and you use it to cover a hole. Seraphal said as she walked with her betrothed through the rocky setting of the underground training area Ikigo had dug out, complete with an artificial sky for a day-night cycle. I was, kind of expecting something more. It's not really activated yet. The Shinigami returned. I'm told that the light in here can emit a certain frequency to emulate something similar to low oxygen conditions for devils for hypozic training, both physically and magically. Your guys figured out a light frequency that can mess with devil magic? She asked in surprise and veiled disbelief. I advise you just take my word for it and don't ask how it was discovered. Ikigo warned, stilling his body from a near shiver at recalling Mayuri's experiment reports. Seraphal seemed to pick up the hint and let the Shinigami continue their tour. And don't worry about their health, the teachers I've picked out know when to push and when to stop. He reached into his shihakusho and pulled out three dossiers, handing them to the leviathan. She opened the first to see the profile of a bald man with red marking on the corner of his eyes. Ikaku Maderam, lieutenant of Squad 11, specializes in melee combat and runs a dojo in his spare time. We're assigning Tamo and Tsubasa to him since, as the Rook and Knight, they'd do well to train under a front-line melee fighter. She opened the next and saw a more rotund man with gentle gold eyes with short pink hair and a thick mustache. Hachijin Ushoda, lieutenant of the Kaido Corps, specializes in Kaido and invented many new spells of the Shinigami, so it only makes sense to assign him the bishops, Momo and Rea. She moved on to the last one and saw as death. Lieutenant of Squad 10 and an excellent all-rounder. She'll be taking the rest since she knows the importance of strong minds and bodies in battle. And what will be your role in helping my dear little sister? Seraphal said with a pout, purposefully acting childish. Can't spare any time for your future little sister-in-law. I've got an idea for her, but I'm leaving it to be a once-a-week thing. The commander admitted. Plus, unlike Azazel, I take my job seriously. That earned a small giggle from the Leviathan before she noticed an odd scent for the otherwise barren terrain of the training ground. Is that what I think it is? She asked before suddenly running ahead, jumping up and spreading her wings to fly over to a hot spring. She cheered in excitement, quickly landing and crouching down to the water before sticking her hand in it. Ah, Tilda, so nice Tilda. The devil said before pulling her hand out and immediately began stripping out of her clothes. A quick sound of static alerted her that Ikigo appeared, but she didn't stop. Care to join me, she said, on her hands and knees and about to crawl in showing off her naked butt and womanhood. Ikigo's response was a swift and strong smack on her butt, causing her to yelp before falling face first in the hot spring's water. Stop trying to tempt me into sec. The Shinigami scolded as she stood back up with an angry pout on her face and dripping wet. We have that meeting of the young devil's thing to go to later, and if we do start FCK then we'd be at it for hours. So I've heard from my future sister wives. She returned as she started rubbing her butt with a cutesy whine. But did you have to hit me so strong, Tilda? I want you to PND my butt but not. Like. She trailed off when she finally noticed something. 
Ikigo hit her strong enough that she felt it reverberate throughout her entire body, and she was certain she'd be completely tender where his hand hit for quite some time. But there was no sting where she felt his hand hit. She used her magic to generate two small sheets of ice that were capable of casting a reflection and used it to examine her butt, finding it without any indication that it was struck. This is also what I'm giving to the Citri clan, Ikigo said, unsheathing one of his blades as Seraphal dismissed the ice. One of the greatest medical minds in Soul Society's history invented a method of hot spring bathing that can wash away injuries. See for yourself. He held out the blade to the Satan, who got the hint and willingly dragged her palm against the edge. She winced as she cut her skin before sticking her bleeding hand into the water, marveling as her wound quickly stitched itself back together and without leaving a scar. This one is a more minor spring, mainly for recovery after combat training, but I hope this is a suitable dowry for now. She pulled her hand out and felt her healed palm, smiling the whole while. Definitely. Meeting of the Young Lords a couple hours later, and the two made their way to the old devil capital of Luciferd, where a meeting between the standing elders of the devil nobility, the ruling Satans, and the current generation of noble heirs were to take place. The goal of this was for the young devils to make their debut in what would be a tournament of raiding games between them, discussing what their future goals were going to be, and generally get a feel for what the future of devil society was going to be. The room was in the shape of a hexagon with a small incline of a few steps on one end of the room where the elders and satans were seated. There were three desks on two sides for the elders with the center aisle leading up to the grand table where the satan sat. Ikigo and Seraphal talked about sitting in the same chair, just to really PSS off the elders, but Sir Seches talked them out of it since they were already livid about Ikigo even being there. So the soul hybrid settled for a seat on the floor level, near the back wall with a chair he manifested from the ambient Ricey in the building instead. He saw one lean into another and gesture at him. Below the rest of us, where he belongs. He heard one whisper, causing the two to chuckle to themselves haughtily. Ikigo's response was to charge his Ryoryoku into his thumb before flicking it just past the devil's head, narrowly missing it but leaving a baseball-sized hole in the wall behind him. The two looked to the Soul Reaper, who returned their gaze. The two got the idea and kept silent, though now every elder glared at him. Soon the doors began to open and the six young heirs made their way inside. Ikigo recognized Rias and Sona immediately, taking their place on the right of the group as they formed their line, while he had to review the profiles of the other four from what the Satans told him. The next one, wearing a dark suit with a white and gray vest and bearing a physique that reminded him of Chad, was Seriorg Bale. What he was lacking in magical power he made up for in raw physical ability, earning Ikigo's respect. After him was Sigveira Agares, a lovely woman with greenish blonde hair and pink eyes, wearing glasses, a dark formal dress with her clan's seal, a miniskirt and thigh high boots. Then there was Zephyodor Glacia Labolas, a devil with green hair, pointed ears, tattoos on his face, dressed in a rather flashy outfit. The whole thing spelled attention hungry delinquent to the hybrid, and he heard nothing really flattering about him. Only half of them seemed to show any promise. However, the last one immediately gained Ikigo's hatred, Deodora Asteroth. He looked like a gentle one, a pleasant smile, blonde hair, closed eyes, and he was dressed in a black uniform with an expensive-looking fur-lined cloak. His outward appearance reminded him too much of Sasuke Aizen a true wolf in sheep's clothing, a schemer that brought down the guard of those around them in the goal to cause pain. He took a sniff of the air and was immediately assailed with the foul sickening stench of sin. The world went gray and the rusty chains of hell manifested around Ikigo, like a swarm of snakes seeking out their prey in Deodora. Down Rensasegi, Ikigo said as a large hand slammed down next to him, leading to a thick muscular upper body with an elongated skull as a head with glowing yellow eyes. I know and we will. But now is, unfortunately, not the time. The creature growled as the color of the world returned and the creature and chains faded. The paused world resumed as the topic went to the rating game tournament and then their goals for the future. Nothing really interesting, until Sona had to elaborate on her dream about a rating game school. What I have in mind is a school without barriers, Sona said, where low-class devils and those reborn can learn. Ikigo smiled and saw Seraphal nodding along proudly. 
a mood that shifted to annoyance and anger as the elders began to laugh and mock Sona's dream as the ambitions of a foolish child. I'm quite serious, the Citri heiress said, standing firm in her position as the mocking laugh turned to annoyed anger. Sona Citri, if a low class or a reborn has the talent to participate in a game, then it is the duty of the MSTR to recognize that talent. One said in a condescending tone. Our society may be in a PRD of reform, but it simply won't do to educate the rabble as you suggest. Another openly scolded and mocked. Then everything fell silent as an enormous pressure came crashing down on the seated elders, choking them as all eyes went to the seated Shinigami. Sikvera, Zephyodor, and Deodora looked at him in shock, Rias and Sona in fear after remembering what it felt like to be exposed to his Riyatsu. But Seriorg went from shock to excitement. Apologies for this, Sir Zechus, but I do believe that an open admission of treason is deserving of execution, does it not? Ikigo asked, not alleviating the pressure that was concentrated on the elders as he rose from his seat and approached them. Yes, it does, Lord Shogun Kurosaki. The Lucifer Satan answered, maintaining a neutral expression while Seraphal was unashamedly smirking at what her fiancé was doing. However, I must ask you to at least explain before I agree that their mocking of Citri's goal can count as treason. The elders struggled to turn and glare at him, causing him to scoff. It wouldn't do to have you run from your own trial, now would it? He asked before gesturing for Ikigo to continue. They all laugh at mere idea of helping the members of their kind that they consider their lesser. But can you honestly think about the situation of the devil race and tell me that you can just blatantly ignore the chance and opportunity to help your species get stronger, especially with such a simple solution? The hybrid asked, making the Satans give the idea further thought. Ajika created the evil peace system as a way to replenish the number of devils, since you were so close to extinction as a result of that last war. A good start. But wouldn't it also make sense to help train and build them up? Give them some help to strive for their goal. How? Dare. One of the elders started before the pressure doubled, causing the LBR breathing to stop entirely as they began to suffocate. According to them, that is pointless. Ikigo calmly continued, as if discussing the weather or having tea and not choking the life out of the devil elders. They seem to care less about the well-being of the race as a whole and care only about their precious bloodlines. Who knows? Maybe it was this mindset that caused so many reincarnates to become strays. He finally let up his Riyatsu and the room was filled with gasping as the elders could breathe again. But this is your decision to make, so I leave it to you. You, arrogant, piece of, one elder shouted as they regained their breaths, only to be interrupted once more. Be silent. Sir Seches ordered, his own tone making no room for defiance or argument. The elders held their tongues, many sweating and all glaring at the soul reaper, while the four Satans seemed to have a silent conversation. Despite your opinion on the matter, Sir Zechus started after a short silence, we do not find them guilty of treason. The elders began smirking and Ikigo could see their egos inflate as they plotted on using this against him. However, your point still stands. We cannot permit the archaic mindset of pure bloodlines to supersede the potential future of our kind, especially not after the display of so many promising reincarnated devils I myself have seen. The four Satans rose to their feet. Therefore, each and every one of these old fools are dismissed from their stations and duties. The elders turned to Sersex in disbelieving shock that shifted to fury. They will not be permitted to select their own successors, that will be our duty and any attempt to circumvent this decision of ours will be seen as the act of treason that will be punishable by death. The four proceeded down the stairs while the elders seethed. Sona Citri's goal of establishing a rating game school is approved and will be enacted on her choice. This meeting is now over. The Lucifer declared as the Satans, the young heirs, and Ikigo left the room with the captain commander walking among the Satans as an equal. This is very reminiscent of my MSTR getting rid of the Central 46, Ikigo said, next to Sir Zechus while the group began to break apart to do whatever. Only Seriorg, Riaz, and Sona continued to follow at a respectable distance. I'll admit my friend, that story you told me was my inspiration for this. The Lucifer admitted with a bashful smirk. The real trick was setting a proper stage and reason to do away with them. If you remember the story correctly, then you know that the next part will be their attempt at a coup. The Shinigami warned, 
with the four devils' response being to shift from bashful to firm resolve. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, though it would be cathartic. Sir Zich submitted, with the other three nodding with him. So, have you decided on the matchups? Ikigo asked, stopping and turning to the devils following them. To their credit, the three managed to maintain their composure. I think they want to know. The four Satans regarded them before Sir Zich's made the decision. First rounds, Gremory vs. Citri, Agares vs. Asteroth, and Bale vs. Glacia Labolas. The others nodded in agreement. Thank you, sirs. The three said with a bow before leaving, though Seriorg kept his gaze on Ikigo for a bit longer. All of you, keep an eye on Deodora. Ikigo warned once they were alone, and he opened a portal. I don't know what he's done, but he reeks of sin, he said before disappearing into the void. Skipping the training arc, party event. No matter how often he came to one of them, Ikigo always hated the ball and parties of high society, especially among the devils. An irritating competition of wealth and status mixed with politicking filled with hidden agendas and fake flattery. Of course it didn't help that for the years he's attended them often involved assassination attempts and condescending tones while trying to weasel their way back into Japan. It didn't matter that this was also a dual celebration. The night before the rating game tournament begins in earnest, and to formally celebrate his and Seraphal's engagement. This cannot end fast enough Ikigo thought as he politely thanked another high-class devil that came to congratulate him and Seraphal, who was at his side. Ikigo was wearing a formal black kimono while Seraphal matched him in a white one, and added middle finger to the elders as they still seethed over being booted from their positions, but they also served as armor thanks to being crafted by the MSTR seamstress of Soul Society, Senjimaru. His eyes drifted to the assembled guests that came in from his faction in both celebration and to serve additional roles for today and tomorrow. The obvious ones were his family members, Ishin in a tuxedo, Masaki in a blue and white dress, Yuzu wearing a white and pink dress, Karen dressed in her Quincy military uniform with her husband Toshiro in his captain's outfit all talking with Sona and the rest of the Citri family. Talking with a few other nobles was Bayakuya Kuchiki and Rukia also in their captain garb, while Neliel and Oroheim were enjoying the food while trying to keep their own white dresses clean. Esdeth was in her Shinigami outfit and staying close to the Citri peerage members, while Hachai was in a green tuxedo and trying to enjoy the music. The only other additions were the personal bodyguards Ikigo had brought with him for today. Two black cats with golden eyes that wandered the ballroom, and Tiamat who was on the balcony in her human form and talking with Tannen. Ikaku was still around but he didn't want to attend. How many more? Ikigo asked as the current well-wisher left them, with the other three Satans, Azazel, and Michael stepping up next to them. None. Seraphal said with a smile, sparing a glance to Hachai. The Kaido MSTR nodded and snapped his fingers, enveloping the leaders in a noise isolation barrier. Great. Now all we have to do is pretend that we're discussing something else. Oh ho 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 ho, she said laughing like an obnoxious rich girl in an anime with her hand near her mouth. You've been waiting to do that laugh for a while, haven't you? Sirt such as deadpan. She brings it up every time we see it. I'd like to do that, but I never felt like I had the right chance. Ikigo quoted. Anyways, what's the situation? As he asked that, they all adopted polite smiles while the atmosphere changed to a colder feel. It took some doing, but I managed to piece together a team that are loyal to us and willing to follow your people's direction as a distraction unit. Falbium Asmodeus said, They'll be ready to move out tomorrow, provided we know where they're meeting. Have them follow Nell, Ikigo answered. My best stealth force members will find a proper spot to bring in the rest of the team. Are they the cats? Ajuka asked, making the other angels and devils look at him in surprise. It looks like they have a transformation spell on them. Indeed they are, Ikigo confirmed. Yoroichi and Yoshiro Shihoin, the former and current leaders of the Unmitsukido Corps. Infiltrated so easily. Falbium groaned with a smile. This is bullshit. Anything goes in an actual battle. The ones crying are usually the losers, and I intend to hear the old Satan faction weep in despair by the end of this. The hybrid darkly returned making the others break character as they looked at him in shock before remembering he's had his own wars. Not as grand in scale but far more recent. His longing to end this Kalos Brigade conflict was probably greater than any other. 
Then let's make sure this next stage goes off without a hitch. Azazel said, taking a sip of wine from his flute glass before looking to Sir Seches. What's the stage for the rating game? A game of chess. Seraphal started explaining. Riaz and Sona will have to play each other in chess with a timer, both having two hours for their turns. When two pieces come into conflict, then the corresponding peerage members step up to battle each other in a randomly selected game and arena. The one attacking takes an advantage card while the defender takes a disadvantage card, and they fight with that bonus and penalty. If the attacker wins then the defender piece is removed, but if they win then they stay, meaning rooks, bishops, and knights can have two fights minimum. The rule for defending pawns is that two pieces are removed if they lose, since there are so many of them. The chess game timer is paused for the individual matches. That's definitely going to eat up the clock. Azazel noted before looking to Ikigo. Let's hope they make it interesting enough to keep the audience's attention. I'm not worried. My people are fast and efficient. The head captain returned. It wouldn't be much of an exaggeration to say that a simple touch is the least the Anmitsukido would need to do to finish the job. He claimed as they finished discussing the plan for tomorrow and shifted to happier topics. As they did, Ikigo noticed Kaniko chasing after a black cat with Issei following after her. One pesquisa pulse later, and he found two more presences hiding within the forest around the building. Interesting, he thought as Ajika noticed his expression. Do you sense something, Ikigo? he asked, getting the Satan's focus back onto him. Yes, and I plan on checking it out. Ikigo reached into a pocket and latched arms with Seraphal. I'll be leaving a body double after my sneeze. He whispered to her as his fingers grasped a small, black, RBB ball that was a portable giggy. He held it to his mouth and faked a sneeze, blowing the sphere full of air, his Ryoryoku, and one of his Zanpakuto spirits. In the instant he did that, he immediately flashed away as a perfect replica of himself was now walking with Seraphal after a short stumble. That was the last Ikigo saw of it as he was immediately at the forest's edge and delving deeper inside. Inside the forest. Hello, Shiren said a woman with long black hair, golden cat eyes, black furred cat ears on her head, and two black cat tails. She wore a black kimono that hung loosely on her shoulders and chest, threatening to expose her large chest to the world, with a yellow obai belt and a large gold beads with an ornate headpiece on her hair. She was perched on a tree branch, trying to appear calm but was agitated and ready to bolt as she stared down on the rook of the Gremory peerage. Did you miss me? Big Sister Kuroka Kaniko whispered in shock at seeing her sister again after nearly ten years, ever since she killed her devil NSTR and fled which led to the attempted Nekamata genocide. The cat yaokai turned devil was wearing a sleeveless dress with long gloves that reached past her elbows. Having just come from the party after seeing the black cat she recognized as her sister's familiar. She took a breath and steeled her gaze at her sister. I know what the Nabrius clan did. She told the other devil, if Kiroko was surprised then she didn't show it. But I want to hear it from you. Why did you go rogue and turn into a stray devil? To protect you. Kiroka answered without hesitation, jumping down to her sister's level. As I grew in power, my former MSTR wished to subject you to those cruel experiments in the hope of manufacturing powerful devils. Her expression softened as she tried approaching Kaniko, only to stop as the white cat devil took a step back. I wanted to take you with me, but I couldn't get to you and had to flee. I'm happy to see you looking so good. Kaniko smiled back to her sister, but didn't lower her guard. I was lucky to be taken in by a very kind MSTR. The Gremory Rook said, stepping back as Biku suddenly appeared next to her sister, in his armor with staff in hand. Come on Kiroka, hurry it up, he said, scanning around the forest, clearly scared of something. Arthur was very clear. Get in, grab her, get out, no time for happy reunions. Kuroka took her comrade's agitated advice and got to the point of her visit. Shiren, I'm here to take you back, she said with finality, shocking the younger Nekamana. The Gremory family did well by you so far, but I can't trust them with your safety anymore. Not with how vindictive the rest of devil kind can be and especially not after that mess with Kakabil. I'll admit that most of that is my fault but I refuse to trust you in the hands of such weaklings. Or are you going to try and prove me wrong? She called out to a bush, causing Issei and Rias to reveal themselves. 
Issei was in a dark suit while Ria's was in an elegant red dress with a dark pink, and both were glaring daggers at Kuroka. Yaokai have a similar sensory ability to the members of the Gotai, you can't hide from me. I'm getting rather sick of everyone reminding me about that incident. Rhea's practically growled as she glowed with devil magic while Issei activated his boosted gear. But I'm even more fed up with people thinking they can take away my precious household members. First Gasper and now Kaneko. The Gramary family has my thanks for protecting her, but she's my precious little sister. Kiroka returned, herself glowing a deep blue. I won't be content unless I know she's safe. No time for banter red dragon, Biku said as he swung his staff and forced the Gremory members to jump apart as he cratered the ground. But we're on a time clock, he charged at Issei, forcing the devil on the defensive, his sacred gear not fully activating as a result of being at a crossroads. He was forced to split his focus between hearing D. Drag's voice advising him and avoiding the monkey demon's attacks. He spared a quick glance to Ria's, only to find her on her hands and knees and coughing up BLD. Kuroka was standing over her while carrying an unconscious Kaneko in her arms with a dense black fog around them. I'm sorry, she said, actually sounding sincere. But I don't have the time to take it easy on you. If you don't move much, then you can probably survive my poison mist until help actually arrives. She turned around and started walking away. Ria's trying desperately to charge an attack before stumbling. As that was happening, Issei was frozen in place out of shock at seeing what happened to his beloved Reyes, leaving him easy prey for Biku to bash his head and knock him to the king of the peerage. Do yourselves a favor and stay down. The monkey said as he rushed to his comrade's side. Arthur, get us out of here. Issei could only watch helplessly, his vision swimming and BLD flowing from his crown as he saw a blade cutting through the air and opening a hole in dimensional space. He's not here? A young man, probably Arthur, said as he stepped out of the tier and started looking about frantically. He had blonde hair with a small braid on his left side and was wearing a business suit with glasses on his face, which was a mask of anxiousness as he kept scanning the forest. At his side was a two-handed long sword with a simple cross guard, while in his hand was another similar blade with a more elaborate cross guard, but both swords gave off a powerful holy aura that made Issei's head throb just by looking at it. Then we lucked out, let's go. He ordered, as they turned but found the tear had sealed. Dia it, I lost my focus. Arthur cursed as he rose his blade to make another cut, starting to sweat nervously. Dia it is a cursed, frustrated at his own weakness despite the twenty days of training under the Dragon King turned Devil Tannen. If he had his balance breaker, this fight would have gone differently, he just knew it. Instead, he was about to lose another friend, the Gremory Peerage was about to lose a precious family member and he couldn't do anything. He needed strength, he needed power, he needed, Prez, let me poke your nubs, he shouted loudly, causing everyone to stop and look at him with incredulous expressions. Even Kaneko woke up to that. There was a loud crack that rang throughout the forest, but that was ignored. What? Kuroka and Rias asked while Issei forced himself to his knees and helped his king to hers. Please, I know if I poke your melons, I can save Kaneko, he said with a completely serious and determined look, that everyone felt disgust and pity for. Seriously? What the hell? Kiroka asked again. I heard from Volley that he had to threaten melons before getting the red dragon to become an actual challenge. Biku said, still processing what they just heard. I just thought he was shitting me. He's an irredeemable pervert big sister. Kaneko said, causing Kiroka to cradle her sister closer. Now I really can't leave you with them. The black cat said as she created a wall of earth and roots between her group and Issei. Let's get back to leaving. Rias looked at Issei before sighing and moving her dress's chest window to free her chest, the cold air causing her pink nubs to become irked and protrude. Do it. She ordered, losing any shame or embarrassment if it meant saving her precious household member. Poke both of them, right now. Issei merely nodded, most of his lustful thoughts gone for once as his main focus was on helping his kuhai. With steel determination, he pressed both of his index fingers against her nubs. Rias let out a small mew of delight before Issei's fingers sank into her bountiful chest and making her eminent amount in pleasure. That music soothed his soul and allowed him to understand an ancient truth of the universe. Not really, but that's what it felt like to him. 
Welsh Dragon, Balance Breaker, Issei announced as he was now clad in a red draconic armor, his powers growing immensely, and now ready for the next round. Dragon shot, he called out, firing a blast of crimson energy at the wall. The wall was easily disintegrated by Issei's power, causing him to smirk under his armored mask. That smirk turned to dismay as the energy was reflected back, causing him to grab Reyes and dive out of the way. What the hell? The red dragon cursed, looking back to see Arthur with one of his swords held out and the man looking disappointed. Let me give you some advice. Fancy tools and natural talent are only as strong as the one wielding them. He said, lowering the sword and turning back around. Until and unless you truly understand that sacred gear in yourself, then you have no right to call yourself strong or even capable of protecting anything. A very brutal teacher I had made sure to drill that into my head. I wasn't that bad, was I Arthur? Ikigo asked, suddenly appearing in front of the swordsman. Arthur proceeded to let out a scream of terror as Biku and Kuroka got ready to fight with their staff and magic respectfully. Arthur immediately swung his blade at the captain commander, an act of pure reflex, one that would prove useless as Ikigo casually caught the blade with three of his fingers. The next thing the three members of the Kalos brigade would know was the cold grip of death as they saw Arthur nearly cut in half. Biku's head punched so strong that it snapped clean off, and Kuroka's throat ripped out. Within an instant, they were all killed, and helpless to do anything as they dropped to their knees and were brought back to reality. They were all still alive and Ikigo held Arthur's blade, examining the holy sword. Isn't this Caliburn? he asked, not getting an immediate answer as the three were still processing their near-death experience. When the hybrid noticed this, he snapped his fingers in front of his former student. Arthur? Answer my question. Ye yes, that's the sword known as the strongest of the holy swords, said the heir of the Pendragon bloodline, still shaken from old traumas coming back from his youth. I, I also found the lost Excalibur fragment, Excalibur ruler. He wanted to hold his tongue, knowing this knowledge could be used against him, but he couldn't help himself. Almost ten years since he last saw his former swordsman instructor, and he was back to being a helpless child in front of him eager to please and avoid punishment for whatever wrong he had done. Which was around the same time he realized that Ikigo was probably PSS that he joined a terrorist group. Well, at least they were recovered, Ikigo said, presenting the blade back to his student. By the way, how are your sisters? Le Fay joined me in the Kaos Brigade, Arthur answered, taking the sword back with shaking hands and unaware of Ikigo now slipping on a black glove. Artoria and I dueled for Caliburn and I haven't seen her since. I did hear she took the wrong Aminiad when she ran off. Ikigo hummed in thought, before quickly smacking Arthur across the face with enough force that he fell to the ground. First, I'm proud that you have remembered my lessons in swordplay and are continuing to improve yourself. The Shinigami said as Arthur got back to his knees, holding his stinging face. Second, I'm less happy that we're now on opposite sides. Give me reason to, and I will not hesitate. Understood. Yes, sensei, he said, sounding defeated. Ikigo nodded and made his way to Kuroka, who was still holding Kaneko in a protective manner. Despite the fear and understanding of just how outclassed she was, she kept an animalistic glare of slitted eyes and a bared snarl that dared him to try and hurt her sister. I understand your concern, and you have every right to be worried. He told her, not in an authoritative tone but one of understanding and sympathy. I was in your position once, and I fought like hell to make sure my younger sisters were safe as well. He knelt down to her level. Kiroka hissed but didn't back away. Shiren is safe in the Gremory household, no other devils care about their servants nearly as much. Everyone learned the truth about what the Nabrius family was doing, and while you are still a wanted stray devil, that's mainly out of concern that you'd attack others mindlessly. Your sister is useless as a target to those idiots. Besides, I know for a fact that they hate me almost as much as they do the biblical god. He held out his arms. So don't worry. She'll be fine. She kept snarling until a pair of hands touched her face. Her expression softened and she looked down to her sister, smiling up to her with her own white cat ears out. Sister, I'll be fine, she told the black cat. I'm glad to know the truth, but my place is with the Gremory family. Kiroka's glare faded, shifting to reluctance and worry, but she ultimately released her sister. 
Kaneko got to her feet and walked toward Rias, who was watching the display with Issei. You've gotten so strong, Shiren. Kiroko whispered with pride, her eyes tearing up as she watched her sister reunite with her peerage. She eventually tore her gaze back to Ikigo, who gently placed his gloved hand on her chin. I can make this promise, he said, Kiroka noticing a dull burn from his gloved hand. You will be able to fully reunite with your sister, but be more careful so I won't have to do something far more drastic. He released her and walked over to Biku, and just immediately punched him in the face. Don't got anything for you, he said as the monkey laid unconscious on the ground. All right, take your friends and go Arthur. Thank you, Sensei. The swordsman said as he and Kiroka rose to their feet, the cat devil picking up their downed companion as Arthur cut open a portal. Ikigo nodded as they departed before flashing away himself, leaving Rias and her two household members alone. Wah, what was that? The Gremory heiress shouted, shooting up to her feet. He had them on their knees and he just let them go. How long was he here anyway? She kept ranting and raging while Kaneko and Issei just stood by and watched. Back at the party. For real, why did you let them go Ikigo? Why didn't you step in sooner? Michael asked as Ikigo returned to the party, now nearing its end, and filled in the rest of the biblical faction leaders on what had transpired. It seemed like no one noticed that he left at all, though Ajika did admit there was a few close calls during the mandatory dance that Seraphal and Ikigo had to do. Apparently dancing with a puppet is a little awkward. Simply because something told me that it would have been for the best if I let them push Issei and then let them go. Ikigo answered, not admitting that Uryu sent him a text stating don't step in until after Issei does his poke. They don't actively seek destruction, they seek challenge and excitement, more neutral than actively malicious. That's something we can use to our advantage since they can be just as much potential allies as they are confirmed enemies. Being a little risky, don't you think? Azazel asked with a smirk as he drank some wine. Unless there's another ulterior motive you have. Everyone was silent as they waited for Ikigo's response. You bugged them with that surveillance bacteria stuff, didn't you? Of course I did. He casually admitted. It was a sensible decision. Scare them into SBMSN, infect them, and then let them run off. Now we have a way of keeping tabs on some of the Kao's brigade. You're a little scary, you know that right? Sir Sexes admitted. Let's remember to get along. Ikigo returned with a smile, dropping it as his instincts flared up. He turned his head toward the balcony and threw his hand up, catching an arrow with a gleaming silver arrowhead and lightly colored with gray feathers on the end. There was a shock wave from the arrow's flight and sudden stop as the energy empowering it fully discharged, a strong wind blowing throughout the room and creating a large mess. This arrow. Looks like she's here he thought as the Satans were resolving the panic. Ikigo aided this by unleashing his Riyatsu until everyone calmed down. Sorry about that, but we have some guests that we need to go greet. He announced as he wordlessly cast two Horan Kaido spells, catching each leader present in a cord of energy light before flashing away with them in tow. Underscore 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 Yeah, I just did that. Sona's idea for a school was logical and common sense, so FCK the old guys that laughed it off. They're gone but not dead. Yet. Same with Deodora. We all know the S-class but that guy is. But the devils can't just accept him getting killed just because Ikigo said so. So he unfortunately still lives. For now. The training arc, I've been hitting a roadblock on that for a week before deciding to just sum it up. Otherwise I never would have progressed, but it does get some coverage. Yes, I'm also accelerating that particular story arc between Kuroka and Kaneko. Considering the circumstances of Kuroka's murder of her MSTR and the Nabarius clan's crimes were made public, it would make sense that any sense of antagonism between the two would go away rather quickly. Especially since Kuroka reasons here are canon to the source material. Another reminder, Ikigo trained Arthur in this version. 
underscore 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 extra content the training of the citri Tamo Meguri and Tsubasa Yura were subjected to sparring matches with Ikaku Madaram, building experience, stamina, and endurance after some general harsh physical conditioning to build strength and speed that the whole peerage had to do. Momo Hanakai and Reya Kusaka were often trapped in various kaido barriers and binds that they needed to dispel with as little magic as possible while trying to stop him from casting the next spell, which was next to impossible given the distance he maintained and the speed at which he cast kaido. Sona Sitri, Tsubaki Shinra, Jinsho Saji, and Ruruko Nimura was subjected to Ez Death's tender mercy, usually sparring as well until she got a proper feel for the group. Ruruko was left on her own with a bunch of random tools and gadgets, considered the weakest link and told to fix it herself since the other three had more potential and thus more priority. Sona and Tsubaki were made to spar against each other with various goals and restrictions during said matches, but after that Sona was made to play and win in various strategy and luck-based games while Tsubaki got some extra training under Ikaku since their main weapons were polearms. Saji found himself pushed to the brink of death literally every day. The once-a-week sessions with Ikigo comprised of exposing them to the weight of his Riyayatsu and making them envision and experience their own deaths time and time again until they could stand to face him. When it was just him and Sona, then he would unsheath his Zampakuto Kagatsuchi and forced her to counter his flames with her water. Eventually he presented her with a sword specially crafted to enhance aquatic powers and began training her in swordplay. Twenty days passed with minimal rest for all of them, just enough to keep them from breaking down completely while Soul Society's medical technology kept them physically fit and healthy. Party Conversations Tiamat and Tannen should we be concerned that this soul society has the means to restore you to godhood? The dragon king turned devil asked the dragon goddess, him in his full form and stature, while she was in her human appearance garbed in a v-neck sea green gown with an aqua sash from her left shoulder to her right hip. What else could they be capable of and are you sure they're trustworthy? My case is rather unique Tannin and yes, they are trustworthy. Tiamat answered, drinking her wine from a flute glass and you should see it for yourself, their own dragon restoration project. While they are lacking in intelligent dragons, they are doing what they can with our more animalistic kin and those mutated by draconic energy. I've even been helping, but it's more akin to an insect hive with me, waiting for my nests to be completed by my workers before I start breeding again. So how long before we can expect new members of our kind? The Blaze Meteor Dragon has continued, idly wondering if he could request their aid in manufacturing the dragon apples that so many of their kind need to survive. Well, they're working on growing a new tree in their shadow Karakura and a new mountain in the Soul Society, both to serve as my new nesting sites, but neither are ready yet. Though, I do have a mate in mind to sire the next generation, she said, making Tannen look over to Ikigo. Are you sure? I'm not doubting his strength, but maybe his intentions. I see a lot of my brother in him, she defended. Besides, I already ensured that they wouldn't abuse the dragons in exchange for my aid. Besides, you're too young to know, but the balance of souls supersedes everything else. It's in everyone's best interests to make sure it stays balanced, and that counts for all races, dragons included. Hmm. Then I'll take your word for it. Tannen acquiesced, deciding to enlist their aid with the dragon fruit. Now, if I may be so bold as to ask for help in a certain matter. Ize and Seji. Our game soon. Saji said, sitting back to back with Ise during the party. Yeah, Ize agreed, feeling the determination in his friend's tone. I've been training. My too, spent my days on a mountain getting chased by a dragon. Ize boasted, confident that his training was harsher. When he received no response, he turned to look at Saji and came face to face with a dead-eyed expression that only spoke of horror. Issei, you see that tall Shinigami woman with the icy blue hair? The student council member asked as he pointed out the squad 10 lieutenant. Her name is Esteth Pardas Kurosaki, one of the wives of Captain Commander Kurosaki. She was my teacher. 
hearing that filled Issei with indignation as he forgot the tormented look on Saji's face. Wah, you got to train under a babe like Fa. I would have traded places with you in a heartbeat if it meant getting away from her. The other pawn interrupted. I don't know how strong you think you had it, but one of the first things she said to me was that she was very familiar with how far to bend someone. Issei looked at Saji's face again and felt like he was seeing a stranger. Any sense of life was gone from his friend. All Issei could do was shift the conversation to a different topic. Anything to get Saji away from his potential PTSD.